And we are live. Hey everybody, this is Roberto Blake helping you create something awesome today. Welcome back. I hope all of you can hear me. Actually, I need to do one quick thing here. I actually need to plug in the right cord. <laughs> so today we have a live stream and today we're going to be doing something that I think a lot of you are going to enjoy. We're going to actually not only be diving into YouTube analytics and I'm going to help you out with a few YouTube cheat codes, but we're also going to be talking about, wait for it, we're going to be talking about my book and we're going to be going over some of the materials in my book because uh, this has basically been a month since we launched the book August 22nd and is now out in hardcover and paperback in addition to Kindle. So no, this won't just be a stream to plug my book, but we are going to actually go over a lot of the things I reveal in the book that could actually help you in your career as a content creator, which is kind of the whole point of me writing the book. We're going to take some of your questions. And if you haven't, gotten the book yet please make sure you do the link is in the description down below of the video and also thank you to our good friends at Streamyard. Uh, we are simulcasting to youtube facebook twitch um linkedin live twitter and my facebook group right now because of Streamyard and the great folks over there so thank you to our friends over at Streamyard and all of our sponsors we will also be talking about sponsorship because that's actually something in the book that I think is not talked about in other materials and other creator books out there. Sponsorship is not talked about a lot. I do actually have a really good section about it in the book. In my next book, which will be the follow-up to this book, I plan to actually have a dedicated chapter entirely to sponsored content and brand deals. Every one of the seven streams of income for content creators will have a chapter in my next book. The next book has already been outlined. I've already started the first 100 days of writing my second book. Uh, so I think that's going to be really good. The second book is going to be called The Creator Economy, The Secrets of Full-Time Content Creators Revealed. Um, I think that's a good title for it. You can think of it almost like the millionaire next door for content creators because everyone makes these weird assumptions about content creators who are full-time and nobody has any idea. Which is why today we're going to be talking about how to become a full-time content creator, which is a lot of the thesis of my book, Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from Their Passion in the Creator Economy. So let's start with um, something that I think a lot of you probably need to understand in terms of being a full-time content creator. Being a full-time content creator is not just limited to YouTubers, which I think some of you understand. You can be a full-time content creator without being a YouTuber. You could be a podcaster. My friend Pat Flynn was a podcaster before he was a, a YouTuber. So you could be a podcaster. You could be a live streamer, and there's more than streaming on YouTube. Obviously, we're simulcasting to Twitch. I'm a Twitch affiliate, but I'm not a Twitch partner. If I was a Twitch partner, I have to worry a lot more about exclusivity in those things, which I don't like. You know me. I don't believe in being loyal to a platform. These platforms ain't loyal. Why are you? So I believe in being platform agnostic. That's also my approach as a streamer. I am platform agnostic. So I am streaming on every platform that I have monetization in and a few that I don't. And so I'll give you a primary example. We have YouTube monetization, which means we have super chats. We have ad revenue for this stream. We also have the merchandise linked in the YouTube shopping linked up for this stream. So we have multiple monetizations with YouTube. However, I am a Twitch affiliate, which means that I also am monetizing over on Twitch during this stream. But that's more like, you know, paid subs, donations, bits, same as Super Chats on YouTube. However... Facebook has monetization too. Now, while I don't have in-stream monetization yet on Facebook, what I do have is I have Facebook stars. People could donate over there. So most platforms do allow content creators to monetize through fan funding. And YouTube is actually announcing very soon what the specific details will be around the lower requirements for the fan funding donations, channel memberships. That's the other thing. We have channel memberships. Thank you to all the channel members, by the way. So thank you to the artist Haven and all of the other channel members, Sewing Report, uh, Feast with Cornice, and all the other wonderful channel members who graciously 
uh, give $5 every month. So we do appreciate you and to anybody who super chats. But what you should be thinking about is why am I loyal to a platform? The reason that people are loyal to the platforms are because they are obsessed with getting their numbers up because it's the vanity metrics, right? The vanity metrics are what make people loyal to the platforms because where you should be really focusing to be a full-time content creator is looking at um, every platform that is willing to pay you and then thinking about how do I at least focus on the platform enough to get to the requirement thresholds where they will pay me. Um, Virtual Violence Gamers Hero uh, is over on Twitch and he has a question. And that's the other thing about great about StreamYard is I can bring up the questions from every platform. Did you see where they're changing the Twitch uh, threshold payouts from $100 to $50. I did see that. I did see that. And that's actually really dope. So that is something, you know, um, worth doing. And so I definitely appreciate that. But heads up for everybody. Uh, Sewing Report says, Roberto's member co- only content is worth joining for. Yeah, the members only content is five exclusive videos or early videos. Uh, some are exclusive, some are early per month. Five for five dollars, which by the way is a hack for all of you. If any of you have YouTube channel memberships enabled, and YouTube channel memberships is now available to everybody who's in the YouTube partner program who's monetized with the 4,000 hours of watch time and the uh, 1,000 subscribers, you can actually do really well with getting, um, you know, memberships where people are paying like five dollars a month. YouTube does a 70 30 split, so you get three dollars and 50 cents a month for every member. You can do really well with that if your promise to your audience is five exclusive members only videos a month for $5. That's worth it for most people. They will pay a dollar per video or piece of content or live stream or whatever. So that's actually really smart and a good way for y'all to market your channel memberships is five for $5. Okay. Kind of think of it like when Subway used to do $5 footlongs, it's five for five. Okay. So that's a good marketing tactic for channel memberships. And we'll talk about the different ways to make money on this stream. This stream is much more of a money stream. And again, we will also talk about my book. My book is actually here primarily to help you grow your audience, make more money off of your content, have the business side somewhat down, but also understand what grows an audience and how to become a full-time content creator and not just a hobby content creator. So I think... um, that's definitely important, and that's why I wanted to bring that up. So, yeah. And, yes, um, let's see. Hey, Roberto, any advice for an anime channel? I know you love anime. Uh, love from France. Um, the main thing is you'd have to understand the community. That's what, uh, you know, uh, friends of the channel, like... Um, SSJ9K, Geekdom101, Naruto Lane, they're all friends of the channel. They're anime YouTubers who all grow. And the main thing is understanding the audience and the culture. Elijah Bale asks, um, hey, Roberto, how does Twitch affiliate work? The way Twitch affiliate works is very similar in some regards to YouTube. A Twitch affiliate, however, is just someone who has a 50-50 split with Twitch on the donations and the paid subscriber memberships. Uh, and that's basically how that works in terms of Twitch affiliate. They just call it Twitch affiliate and, and they have a different tier that they call Twitch partner. YouTube is about to do something similar with YouTube fan funding. YouTube is not going to lower the requirements for the partner program. But what they are going to do is lower the requirements for fan funding, which means channel memberships, paid channel memberships, super chats, super thanks, super stickers will be available to people without having to become a YouTube partner. That is coming soon. They're going to announce it. It's going to come in 2023, but they'll make an announcement about the requirements soon. I'm assuming, now this is just Roberto's best guess. Roberto's best guess, what I'm assuming is going to happen with YouTube fan funding is I think that it's going to be 500 subscribers, and 1,000 hours of watch time. That is what I believe it will be. And the reason I believe that is I believe that they will lower it to that to give you the fan funding because it makes the most sense since they give you the community tab at 500. They probably will give you fan funding at 500. The only thing I could see it going lower to is 100 subscribers 
and 1,000 hours of watch time. And if it becomes that, I think it's going to body Twitch. However, I think that since YouTube doesn't have exclusivity clauses, you should be simulcasting, simul streaming to whichever platforms you can be monetized on. And so for me, Facebook gives me a monetization option. Someone can buy Facebook stars and donate to me. All right, so that's possible on Facebook for me. There is a subscription model on Facebook. there, And I do have Twitch affiliate and I am monetized on this YouTube channel. And the other reasons to do LinkedIn and uh, Twitter are I can use their notification system to reach a broader audience. And then someone will say, hey, I want to watch this on YouTube. They're about to be watching on YouTube. All of you got the YouTube alerts. You got alerts on one of my other platforms because I'm simul uh, streaming. And so by simulcasting, it's a hack to be able to get more people onto the better viewing experience. And I don't worry about taking a view from YouTube or taking a view from this or taking a view from that. I'm more worried about my brand than their platform. And so I want you all to change that mindset shift of caring much more about your own brand and less about their platform. Because when you decide to be loyal to a platform instead of being platform agnostic, I, AKA I will go anywhere the audience is and I will go wherever the money is. That approach, that approach is much more practical for you. It won't grow your favored platform faster, sure. But see, that shouldn't be your real goal. Your real goal should be for you to be able to maximize your brand and also to serve the audience instead of, but the platform kind of rigs it to where they make you feel like you have to always do what's in the best interest of the platform, if you get what I mean. So I just want to make that uh, clear and I hope that that helps you guys out. So one of the things that I want to bring up is I want to tell you a little bit about at least what chapters are in the book so that you know what we'll be kind of talking about here on stream. And so I'm just going to read you the table of contents here of the book, but you guys should definitely get it. It's linked in the description down below. But the first chapter is about the creator economy, so it explains what it is and what the opportunity is. The second chapter is about building a powerful personal brand. The third chapter is about no more starving artists. It teaches you the importance of using these platforms as a career and as a business and monetizing them properly. So that becomes very important for the far majority of you. Chapter four is about monetizing your creativity and it teaches you the different methods of monetization. And there are seven main methods of monetization and we're going to talk about them heavily here on the stream. And then after that, it talks about value first content, content that's extremely valuable to the viewer. Then it talks about authenticity and setting boundaries in chapter six, creating a community is chapter seven, how to be noticed and how to stand out is chapter eight, which a lot of you as small YouTubers really will care about. Uh, chapter nine is picking a platform and I explain the differences between these platforms and what they all have to offer. Chapter 10 is about feeling overwhelmed and overworked, which a lot of you fall victim to. Chapter 11 is about imposter syndrome. I know a lot of you are feeling that. Me, I sometimes still go through that. 12 is about consistency and why consistency is king. In chapter 13, I talk about building a million dollar creator business. My creator business throughout my entire career has definitely generated over a million dollars. Last year, it generated uh, $400,000. It's on track for over 300,000 this year. Last year was an outlier. Year before that, it did 300,000. Year before that, did a quarter million. I've done six figures for six years consecutively. I don't say that as a humble brag. I say that as somebody who worked a nine to five job 10 years ago, was making 30 something thousand dollars a year in a small town in North Carolina. I now live in Georgia. I'm a homeowner. I'm not a millionaire. I am a six-figure entrepreneur. I do have a multiple six-figure net worth. I have built a successful business even beyond my YouTube channel as a creative entrepreneur. But these opportunities were opened up because of these platforms and the creator economy. I used a combination of Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn specifically, and a little bit of Instagram because I got some Instagram brand deals and that actually helps. 
I use these platforms to my advantage. I let myself use the platforms to my advantage. I didn't let the platforms take advantage of me. And that's what I try to teach y'all. I try to teach y'all how to take advantage of these platforms, use them for your benefit and the benefit of your audience and not be taken advantage of by the platforms, by the sponsors, by the brands. I build positive relationships with my brands. I try to build a positive relationship with all of you, the audience, you know, at, whether it's you, Alan Spicer, OG, you know, supporter and other fellow online educator, or whether it's the lovely Melly Cinco, you know, holding it down, has her own baking business, is a wonderful entrepreneur, you know, single mom. Shout out to all the single moms holding it down. I grew up with one myself, you know, wh whether it's Power Purpose, whether it's Andy, you know, I try to do everything I can to cultivate a positive community here. I do see we have uh, super chats. I am going to get to those, but to round out like what else is in the book. Yes, I talk about building a million dollar creator business. Um, I talk about people who've done it successfully. I talk about the importance of collaborating and networking. I talk about how to pivot and adapt. Chapter 16 is how to become known for something. Number 17 is how to deal with criticism, which is very important. Even I struggle with that. Number 18 is about staying motivated and the creator mindset. 19 is how to deal with your failures. And in 20, I reveal what I in quotation marks call secrets. They're not really secrets. I've talked about them so much. They're not really secrets and revealing my secrets as a full-time content creator. So those are the chapters in the book. And I, I'm really looking forward to more of you buying, more of you reviewing, and more of you just understanding the value of the book. I wrote this book for every content creator in every part of their journey, whether you're already a full-time content creator, whether you're aspiring, or whether right now you're a working-class content creator trying to grow. But we do have a super chat that I want to get to. We have it from, I believe, Slandered Gaming. So we have a super chat. Super chat. Looking at setting up a merch store for my channel, any tips? Is Shopify worth the money and cost? Do you particularly do uh, particular items sell better than others? So this is a great question about merchandise. So with YouTube shopping, once you're monetized on YouTube, you get access to what's called YouTube shopping. And so with YouTube shopping, there are a lot of different things you can do, including um, something here. I think I can show you on the back end. So some of you probably right now, I'm going to share my screen. Some of you right now probably see some um, items uh, below my video in terms of merchandise, just like uh, the Create Something Awesome Today hoodie, okay? So here in video monetization for a live stream, you actually have what's called tagged products during a live stream. So during a live stream, they're tagged products and people could buy these and you can set the price. Now I'm using, um, you know, a company called spread shop. Who's also a sponsor of the channel. Shout out to spread shop, but on the back end of YouTube, you, you have this. Okay. And also in general monetization in YouTube studio, even if you go over to what's called YouTube shopping, you can connect a store. Now I've connected, um, what do you call it? I've connected spread shop. And so these are, you know, just different products from my spread shop store. Now you do have the option to use another Avenue, uh, the other than spread shop, you can use uh, spring, which used to be teespring, which is their competitor, but now you can use Shopify. And the good news about Shopify is you can also sell physical and digital products with Shopify. And so a lot of people don't understand, well, okay, why would I pay for Shopify every month when Spreadshop and Spring are free? Well, you pay the $29 to Shopify because you can make different products and you can sell different products and it's physical and digital. Now, both of those other two companies are moving to where they can do digital products. However, what you can't do is you can't source the merchandise itself like you could with spread uh, with Shopify. So with Shopify, if you said, well, I want to ethically source all of my vendors. So I want um, less environmental impact or I want this type of fabric or material or I don't, I'm, I'm against fast fashion, whatever. Then you could source your vendors for your print on demand products 
through Shopify. It will cost extra money. You will most likely pass that cost on to your customer, but you can do that. The margin gets lower though, because you are paying something upfront for Shopify every month, the $29. So if you don't sell anything that gets, you know, to be a pain. The other thing is um, in terms of the, the orders, depending on how you're going about the print on demand, there might be a minimum order requirement from your vendor. It depends. So there are advantages. The other thing is you can make custom products and you could sell custom products. You could have things manufactured for physical products like phone accessories or custom phone cases or, or things like that. So the opportunities and potential is unlimited with Shopify. So you're paying for potential. But if you just want to make hats and hoodies, then I say just use Spreadshop. And I believe I have them linked in the description, or you can go to robertoblake.com slash go slash Spreadshop, sign up for free and use my link. They're a sponsor, so just throwing that out there. But it's free. So the thing I will tell you is they do make good quality. This is one of my favorite hoodies. It keeps me very warm. Uh, winter is coming. And so, you know, I, I would say that it's not that Spreadshop is inherently better because it's free, by the way. Shopify is trusted by a lot of people, myself included, and Shopify does have a ton of features. You get a custom designed website with Shopify. You get your own domain name with Shopify. You have all these other things. It has a wonderful built-in app and you can track all of your revenue and all of your sales, customer follow-up. You can run the whole thing from your phone. So I'm not knocking Shopify just because it costs money. Far from it. It's worth every penny. But if you do not know that you can sell t-shirts and hoodies for sure, you might as well use Spreadshop because it'll cost you $0 up front other than whatever you pay your designer to help you design things. So that's what I would recommend. So great question. And thank you for that super chat. Appreciate you. But yeah, uh, Power of Purpose says, uh, Roberto, it's a great book, really accessible language, easy to read. Thank you. If any of you have bought the book already, please, today, today, go to Amazon, rate the book, review the book. If you think it deserves five stars, give it five stars. Um, if you've read the book, please, please, please review the book. That really helps me out more than you could possibly know if you rate and give an authentic, real review, especially if you're a verified Amazon customer, it massively helps. So I really do appreciate all of you supporting uh, the book. But yeah, the, the thing I would say about merchandise, merchandise is the people's first foray into products, but it's not the only one that works. Honestly, I've actually made more from the book, treating the book like a merch drop uh, that I have from uh, print on demand this year, this year, uh, just in the month and a half that the book has been out. Um, it's done better than any uh, merch drop I've ever done, but that's just what my situation is. Um, and so obviously that won't be the same for everybody. Some people you're in an entertainment niche. Some of you even as entertainers should consider writing a book. I can tell you a little bit about um the upsides of self-publishing. Self-publishing is actually very lucrative if you can sell, if you can sell. And it actually raises your credibility in other ways. A lot of you don't realize that if you write a book, your rates for brand deals can go up because you could become a best-selling author. If you become a best-selling author, you can increase the rate of your brand deals because the reputation value you have becomes higher. And the same thing for public speaking. If you do public speaking or you do appearances, any appearance fees that you have, any appearance fees that you have go up. If you are an author of a book, even if you're not a bestseller, but Amazon bestseller is still a bestseller. Keep that in mind. And most people today get their books from Amazon. They don't get them from the physical stores as much. They used to, but the game has rapidly changed. Amazon is the biggest bookstore, if not the biggest store in the world. So just keep in mind that many of you, if you're in an education niche or you're in a handcrafting niche or in a DIY niche, any of that, you should be writing a book and you should publish it in Kindle. You should publish a paperback and you should publish a hardcover. And so what I did was I published a hardcover. It sells for a little bit more. It sells for $24.99, but hardcovers are prestigious and some people are collectors. And so they'll get the hardcover. Um, this also works really well with book signings. Hardcovers are also 
Um, like I said, it's a prestige play. The paperbacks are where the sales are. That's accessible and affordable, $14.99 in my case. And then the Kindle books, um, those are really great on pre-orders. And mine was $9.99. And then the future, if you discount the Kindle books, yes, your margin gets lower, but you'll do more sales if you care about that. And so those become opportunities. It's easier to do giveaways for the Kindle book because there's not upfront cost and it's digital and so on and so forth. So uh, much easier to do that, much easier to get reads and things of that nature. So a lot of you should really look at self-publishing, especially since you could technically, unless you need to pay a designer, which I did, and I definitely recommend paying an editor, the cost could be upfront, could be zero, or it could be very low. It could be zero, it could be very low. So that's really, that's really important to think about. Uh, here's Mo. Thank you so much. For those who don't know, Roberto is an awesome person who has vast knowledge of the creator economy. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. Thoughts on the commentary genre in YouTube. The commentary genre in YouTube is actually very challenging because it's actually hard to monetize. Believe it or not, it's actually hard to monetize the commentary drama uh, genre. For one thing, commentary in YouTube is hard to monetize because it's subject to demonetization in the platform very easily in many cases. It's also subject to copyright claims very easily. So it's already hard to monetize. In terms of fan funding, the problem is the audience that enjoys commentary is typically very young. And no offense to anybody, but we all know that uh, young people tend to be broke. Bruh. I'm just spitting facts when I say that. So, uh, you know, don't sit here and don't try and tell me that, oh, Roberto, not all young people are broke. It's like a lot of them are. Speaking from personal experience, young people don't have that much disposable income a lot of the time. And we are heading into a recession. You know, according to some people, including me, we're heading into a recession. So the commentary genre of YouTube, look, it gets views. There are There's a community that enjoys that content. Now, me personally, I've worked with commentary channels. I've had clients who are commentary channels. Some of them are now over a million subscribers. The problem is the monetization piece. The CPMs are lower in some cases. If you get them at all, you get demonetized a lot. You have to fight that. You have to fight copyright claims. You have to fight community guideline strikes from people flagging or reporting you if they don't like the person. If they if they are a lot of people are fans. If you do a commentary channel and you upset someone's fans, someone's fans might brigade you, and then your channel is in jeopardy. The commentary channel genre of YouTube is like it's getting to a point to where I don't know how reasonable it is. If you actually care about money and you want to do this full time, I'm not sure it's it's relatively accessible to be a commentary YouTuber full time anymore. And I don't know that will be in the future. A lot of brands are skittish of commentary channels and not now, now, not all of them. There are people out there who are eating. There are people out there who are making money, but they're established commentators and they've built those relationships. I think it's really hard if someone wanted to be a new commentary channel today. Social commentary has the same risk, but I think it's more lucrative and I think there are more views for it right now, culturally. Uh, so I think people who commentate on uh, culture react to news headlines. I think news commentary it has the same inherent risk, but I think it tends to make more money and I think it tends to get more views, but it also has inherent risk. I am much more conservative than most people when it comes to minimizing risk. When it comes to risk assessment, mitigating and minimizing risk your boy is playing it safe your boy is playing it safe i'm fiscally conservative i minimize my risk i don't swing for the fences even with my content you notice that i play very safe and i don't swing for the fences and i avoid copyright claims and copyright strikes and community guidelines at all cost at all cost and we keep it clean and we keep it sponsor friendly over here and so i think that's something you just have to consider is what you want to make will not always be compatible with what the market wants and will support and also um, what is practical in a monetary standpoint. And so um, there's a phrase that I'm very, very fond of um, and a framework that I'm very fond of that really teaches this and makes it um, much more um, practical I think, 
you know, uh, in terms of if you understand this, then you can be a full-time content creator a lot more easily. So I'm going to share something with you called the Ikigai framework. So this is a philosophy that comes out of Japan. Um, so let me share this on screen. So the Ikigai framework, this is what I use to help content creators. Um, and, you know, this has its origins to Okinawa, Japan. Okay. If you follow the Ikigai framework, you can be a successful full-time content creator much, much more easily. And that's because you have to find uh, what you love to do and what you're good at. And that would be your passion. However, if you can be paid for what you do and you're good at it, then it can be a profession. And so we have to be professionals. If you say, I want to be a content creator for a living full time, do you know what you're saying? You're saying you want to be a professional. You want to be a professional content creator. You want to be a professional content creator. Okay. So that's important. All right. Now, if you're passionate about something and it serves a community of people, then you might have a mission. You might have a mission, but you know what? If the mission ain't making money, you can't fulfill the mission, <laughs> right? How are we going to fund the mission? How are we going to finance the mission? That's just common sense, right? And if we're not good at it, how are we going to fulfill the mission? And if there's no one to serve, then it's not a mission. If we're just doing it for ourselves, it's a passion, not a mission, right? Now, if we're just doing what pays us and what the world needs and we're not passionate about it and we don't love it, that's a vocation. And you have a lot of people who serve in vocations. There are a lot of people, they don't have a passion for the law. They don't have a passion for healthcare services, but it pays really well and the world needs it. So they have a vocation. They have a vocation and they're good at it. So they might be professionals, but they may not be in love with it. They may not be in love with it. And the thing is, life can be hard when, okay, I'm good at this. It makes money. And that's where burnout happens. Burnout happens when you have... I'm good at it, I get paid for it, and the world needs it, but you're not in love with it. That's where burnout happens for a lot of people, okay? Failure often happens when you love doing something and the world needs it, but you're not good at it at all. You just wish you were good at it. You just wish you were good at it, you know? And, and there's a difference between being a poser and being an enthusiast, and that's important to acknowledge, okay? And so... When you're not good at it, but the world needs it and you suck at it and you try to do it anyway because the money is good, that's what being a sellout is. The only time you're a sellout is when the world needs something from you and it pays really well, but you know you ain't good at it and you don't love it and you're only doing the because you know of that, but and you're only doing it for those reasons, you might be a sellout. The difference is the not being good at it part, the not being good at it and not loving it. Because the thing is, you can just be a professional that serves a vocation. If you're good at something, you're doing it for the money and the world needs it. Like you don't, you don't love being a doctor. You don't love being a lawyer. You don't love being an engineer, but you are good at it. You're competent. Then you're not a faker if you're competent at it. And if you're doing it for the money, there's nothing wrong with that. You're a professional. And the world needs it. It's a vocation and you're serving in an honorable way. So the thing is, you can be good at something, paid, it pays very well. You might be motivated by the money and the world needs it. And you could be serving with honor in that case. However, if you're not good at it, you're not good at it, but you want the money and you know there's a demand and it serves a purpose in the world and you're doing it for the money and you're not good at it and you don't even love it, then that's being a sellout. And see, that's the difference. Most people think that as an artist, if they love it and they're being paid for it, that they're a sellout. If they're doing it more for the money versus the love, meaning that they wouldn't do as much of it if they weren't being paid, that doesn't make you a sellout. If you're doing it for the money and you're not good at it, that's when you become a, and, and, and you know the world needs it and you don't love it at all. That's when you become a sellout. And that's what people don't understand. To have balance as a career professional, as a content creator, as a creative pro, to have balance, the reason you have to do things that you do enjoy doesn't have to be the number one thing you're in love with, but you do have to do things you enjoy. And the reason is you will burn out 
if you do not. You will burn out if you cannot enjoy the process. So if we can't enjoy the process here, if we can't enjoy the process, we will burn out. That is just how it is. We will burn out. Bruh. Now, if we are good at it and we love it and there's a demand for it, but we're not being paid and compensated for it, we'll become frustrated because our life is not improving in proportion to the work that we are doing and the response to the work we're doing. It's not enough to be acknowledged for something. It's not enough to be good at something. It's not enough to be in love with something. You, you have to be paid for it in a reasonable way and see your life improve to make it sustainable. Otherwise, it's not fair to you. So that becomes important. And this is like something I talk about constantly in the book. Uh, she fires um, with a Shopify store. You would have to make your own digital product and then sell it on Shopify. Usually what you're going to do is you're going to upload it in a zip file. And then when people purchase, they'll be digitally delivered the zip file or a website page where they have access to it. And so that's how a digital product would work. Um, this is something whenever I get something, excuse me, from uh, uh you know, Nick and D Nimmin with a uh, streamer template store, um, streamer templates.com. Uh, whenever I buy something from streamer templates.com, I get a zip file download and then I get the Photoshop assets from there. So that's how Shopify works. That's built on Shopify. So, so yeah. So what we have to do as content creators is we have to know the things that we like doing. We have to know that there is an audience for that. And the thing is, a lot of content creators don't know, don't realize there's not a big enough audience sometimes for the content they want to make. Sometimes there's not a big enough audience for the content they want to make. Even though they're really passionate about it, not enough other people are passionate about it to get the views that would satisfy them or the views that would pay them. So you have to understand, okay, how big is the market? How do I serve the market? Then you have to figure out how do I monetize that properly? So how do I monetize that properly? And you know that a lot of what I focus on with this channel is helping you monetize properly, but I'm also helping a lot of you with my tutorial and my video editing content, my video editing and Photoshop content. So Premiere Pro and Photoshop are the tools I use. There's more tutorials on that. There's probably a hundred tutorials on this channel. A lot of people are like, oh, you just YouTube help channel. I've been doing tutorials, camera gear, you know, hardware and software for years. There's hundreds of videos of that on the channel. Like a third of my content is YouTube advice. But the thing is, that advice helps you to understand what the world needs and how to build an audience. And then there's information that I use to help you become better at what you're doing, better at your job, better at film, better at editing, better at video, better at live streaming, better at podcasting, better at the, get, finding the right microphones, finding the right tools, getting your sound effects, getting those things. That's important. And then obviously the money piece is important. So these are even the four pillars. If you really look at my own content, Roberto, why do you make motivational and mindset content? Because creators have to learn how to do what they love and what they're passionate about and learn to understand themselves so that they can serve the world better. What, Roberto, why do you make YouTube help in social media content? Because that's really content about marketing yourself and understanding what the world needs from you. Roberta, why do you talk about making money online? Oh, I don't know. So you can be paid for the things that you like and that you're good at. Oh, Roberta, what about these tutorial videos? Uh, make more of those. I will be making more of those so that you can actually be good at this because some people want to make money at this, but they're not actually good at it. That, what, Roberta, why do you do analytics deep dives? So you can actually become good at this and so you can better understand what the world needs. The analytics stuff that I teach will help you identify what the world needs and also make you better at your job as a content creator. However, sometimes we have to go into mindset so that you can have some life balance. You have to have some balance. A lot of you, you're suffering from burnout and you don't understand why. I want to help you understand burnout better. A lot of you are overworking. You don't have good productivity habits. You're not treating this like a professional and you're working all hours of the night. You know what professionals don't do? Professionals don't work all hours of the night. Professionals clock in and clock out. Even entrepreneurs know how to set boundaries, the smart ones, the ones who don't burn out. 
or don't burn out really hard. So you have to understand these things and you have to put it all in its proper pay place. So that's something that I try to help most of you do. And it's most of the reason that I wrote this book is because of this type of framework is that's why I wrote the book is it could help you understand these things a lot better. At some point I'll do a reading from the book. Um, is there going to be an audio book? Yes, there is going to be an audio book. I'm recording it myself. Uh, it's harder than it looks to record an audio book, believe it or not. It's actually hard that it looks actually, you know what? I'm going to do something real quick. Y'all I'm going to, uh, go, uh, adjust the air conditioning here but something i want to do is i did make a little um book trailer i think i have it here i have a book trailer for the book i'm going to play the book trailer for you while i adjust the air conditioning uh, i will be right back I finally did it. I finished my book, Create Something Awesome, How Content Creators Are Profiting From Their Passion in the Creator Economy. The book is available now in paperback and in Kindle where you can read it on any e-reader or device. And I'm really excited about this. The audiobook is coming soon, probably October, 2022. Oh my God, it's so great to be able to have this book done put it up on the bookshelf and to know that all of you who appreciate it, you want to hear what I have to say about the creator economy, becoming a full-time content creator and what the experience and lifestyle of being a content creator actually is like. Uh, this is the book. I, I put 20 chapters in here of the most important things I think that content creators could be focusing on today. I talk about the mental health aspect of being a content creator, uh, getting discouraged, imposter syndrome, not charging what you're worth, and mostly actionable advice around monetizing your content properly, but also how to build an audience on your authenticity and what it's really like to start from zero, even today. So if you're interested, make sure you're checking out the book. You can order it on Amazon. You also probably order it in a lot of other places like Barnes and Noble, and it will be coming to other bookstores soon. Really excited about it. Thank you for all the support and love around the book and the positive reviews. Now go ahead and pick it up and make sure you go out there and create something awesome today. Take care. And so that's my, uh, that's my little book trailer. Uh, we got another super chat here. And it's from... D time Yu Gi Oh! Super chat. Hey, Roberto, I've been on YouTube for four months now and been monetized for three. Congratulations on that. Uh, that deserves a little bit of, I think, uh, recognition. So let's give him a round of applause. And so, uh, I've watched a lot of your videos. I did exactly what you've been teaching. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, D time Yu Gi Oh! I'm actually a big Yu-Gi-Oh fan myself. I grew up with it in the original uh, series uh, back in the Duelist Kingdom and Battle City days, so appreciate you. Um, we got Lewis Joseph here with a super chat. Super chat. How do you begin being a content creator and online business creator? I'm interested in starting an online business channel. Okay. So if you've built an online business then you can build a channel around online business and entrepreneurship. If you haven't yet, if you haven't yet, then the only way to do this would be to document your experiences. So you're not speaking with authority, you're showcasing, you're documenting instead of creating. And so what I would do is I would showcase the journey and I would just admit that you're building in public and don't say that you know, you say, oh, this is what I'm doing. Let's find out what happens and let people uh, take the journey with you. And um, that could be very valuable. And there's a lot of people doing that. And it can be very endearing. So that would probably be my advice there. Shelly saves the day. Hey, friend, probably gonna say hello. Hello to you too, on this fine Sunday afternoon. Monica says, just ordered it. I can send you my confirmation number if you want. Uh, you don't have to do that, Monica. When you do finish reading it, please, please just give it a review in Amazon. If any of you have read the book, please review it in Amazon, rate it in Amazon. It's really important. I can talk to you more about self-publishing if you guys want and uh, why that's important and um, having your own book. But I really do uh, appreciate everybody supporting the book 
and it does mean the world to me. And thank you for making me an Amazon bestseller in the podcasting category. I really do appreciate it. But yeah, uh, when it comes to being a full-time content creator, um, I think that a lot of the pieces that people don't account for, I mean, because yes, we talk a lot about the money. Let's talk a little bit more about the lifestyle changes you have to make. I do go into that in the book pretty heavily um, of one of the big things being the time freedom to do this. The, so the way I became a full-time content creator, a little bit of Roberto story time here. So a little bit of Roberto story time. The way I became a full-time content creator is, oh wait, hang on. Jessica J, hey hon, uh, can't wait to grab a copy. You're so awesome. Thank you, Jessica. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I keep coming to Florida and I keep missing you. So we got to hang out uh, the next time I'm in Florida. Dinner and drinks are on me. Let's uh, let's work that out. But I come to Florida and every time I come to Florida, I miss you. We're like just eh, missing each other. But yeah, Jessica J has a great YouTube channel, has been a longtime supporter, and I really appreciate uh, everything she does. But yeah, Roberto story time. Uh, here is how Roberto became a full-time content creator. So many, many, many moons ago, uh, Roberto was very, very young. Uh, so about roughly, oh, 17 years ago when Roberto was like, no, wait, 16 years ago. Yeah, like 16, 20 years ago. Like 16 years ago, YouTube was a new thing and Roberto found out about YouTube 16, 17 years ago because... Roberto's best friend, Malcolm, brought up his laptop and we started watching videos in the kitchen, me and the boys. It was like me and the boys were in the kitchen and we were watching this video online as you know we were doing like back in the day, back in the day, back in the old days, back in my day. You know, we were watching 15 years ago, like uh, like 16, 17 years ago. There was this cool thing called Terrible Terry Tate Office Linebacker. And it was this spoof. It was this like funny commercial spoof. And you had these office workers sitting around and then somebody would screw something up. And then this big hulking football player would come out and tackle them. And he was terrible. Terry Tate office linebacker. And it was hilarious. And so we were watching this and we were watching um, the too hot for TV ads, the old commercials. Y'all don't understand. People say no one comes to YouTube to watch commercials. Back in 2006, 2005, 2006, all we did was come to YouTube and watch Super Bowl commercials. That's all we did. All we did back in the old days was we came to YouTube and we watched these Super Bowl commercials and it was great. And so you'd get the, you'd get your friends together, you get your family together, and you watch these Super Bowl commissions, new ones, old ones. And also there was a lot of piracy. So we'd watch old TV shows, old forgotten TV shows and things like that, right? And so me and my friends started making little skits and spoofs in indie films. There was no such thing as being a YouTuber back then. You were just posting videos to the internet. And the thing is, me and my friends have been posting videos to the internet for years because we were adults. We were 22 years old at the time. We were like 21, 22 years old. So we had been posting videos since we were teenagers to the internet. There just wasn't a centralized, really good centralized website for sharing online videos. That was the problem that YouTube aimed to solve when I think it was uh, Stephen Chen, Chad Hurley, and the third co-founder, all ex-PayPal employees, part of the PayPal mafia. They were trying to solve the problem of a centralized video hosting website that was actually good. And there were other ones out there at the time. There was like, I don't think Vimeo was around at the time. I think Daily Motion was, but it was not very good. Uh, Vidler was the king at the time, not YouTube. People do not understand. In the 2000s, Vidler was the king. We were posting videos to MySpace, and that was a big deal back then. Uh, Facebook, if you had it at the time. So YouTube was not a popular website in 2005, 2006, even when Google acquired it in November of 2006. Now, all the videos and all the stuff I did with my friends, it went nowhere, and we ended up not making videos together in the future. We tried it multiple times, and just working together didn't work out for us with, our, my, with me and my friends. We would try multiple ventures together, and it just wasn't working. So I went off on my own. Now, when I first started making videos, I wasn't trying to be a YouTuber in 2009. There was no being a YouTuber in 2009, not really. But what I was trying to do was um, 
I had since, you know, left uh, college and been working in my career as a graphic designer and as a creative professional. And I had done other work. I'd done photography. I'd done, you know, a lot of these other different things and even video editing. And what I did was I started teaching what I knew. I started teaching what I knew because back in my day, back in my day, back in 2009, you guys might remember this. 2009, it was very hard to come by really good information from people who weren't like out of the game for 15 or 20 years. Your college professors, a lot of them have been out of the game for 15, 20 years. Don't you want to hear from somebody who was doing it right then and there, someone who was living it at the time? So I was sharing my experiences because as a creative professional, as a designer, uh, because I was living it. And then later as a freelancer. So in 2013, I came back to the platform because in 2009, in 2009, I was still working at a company and I believe I went and worked at a different company um, at 2009, 2010. I moved to New York. So I moved from the North Carolina, I moved to New York and I worked for an ad agency. And so I didn't make as many YouTube videos when I worked for the ad agency. And I was posting random things to YouTube sometimes. Sometimes I would post stuff from while working at the office. Sometimes I would post break dancers that I saw performing in Times Square that looked cool because uh, that's what you did on YouTube. YouTube was very random. In the 2010, 2009, 2010 era, YouTube was very, very random, and it would stay that way for a very long time. It used to be very okay to be very random on YouTube. I don't think you really grew being random on YouTube, but you could blow up being random on YouTube. YouTube Shorts makes that a thing again now. YouTube Shorts made randomness great again or something. But what happened was, and the way I became a content creator was in 2013, I said, you know what? I actually like making videos and I like teaching. I like teaching, I like making videos. And I also had experience as a trainer at my job. So I went and I became a marketing manager at some point in my career. And I was working at a web hosting company. And so I was doing a lot of different tasks. I was in charge of two departments. I was in charge of the web design department and I was over the sales and marketing department. So I was over sales and marketing and I was over web design for our customers, but also internal web design projects. So I was over, and this is back like in the day, this is like a decade ago. I was drastically underpaid, but I was living in the South, right? And so what that means is you do 12 jobs for one paycheck. That's what that looks like. So that's why I'm good at YouTube, by the way. That's why I can do the eight arms of the octopus. And by the way, I still make, edit, produce, shoot, do the thumbnails, do the research, do the titles, everything for the YouTube channel. Roberto does it himself. Everybody, everything for the YouTube channel. All 1,600 videos published to this YouTube channel, except for a handful. Roberto did everything. Roberto did it all by himself. Uh, and I don't say that as a brag. I say that as do not be insane. Do not be insane. And if you don't do everything yourself, you will be a bigger YouTuber than me. It's very likely you will be a, a better YouTuber than me if you do not do everything yourself for a decade and 1,600 videos. Everyone smarter than me hires help sooner for their YouTube channel, okay? I'm a neurotic mess who loves being a control freak over their brand, all right? Uh, ain't nobody supposed to be doing that. And I would have hired a full-time editor here in Atlanta during the pandemic, but the pandemic cut off all physical contact for like, about three years. So I've not been doing everything myself entirely by choice the last three years because I've come to the conclusion that that's not a good idea. There just was nothing to be done about it. I can start to correct that problem now, but I have to build my local network in Atlanta back up because during the pandemic, a lot of people I would have worked with here in Atlanta all moved away, believe it or not, during the pandemic. They all moved. So I have to rebuild a lot of my network here in Atlanta of people that can work with me. Um, and so what happened in 2013, though, was I'm like, OK, what am I good at? Let's bring up Ikigai again, because this is how I became a full time content creator. What do I love? I liked editing videos, not necessarily being on camera. I didn't like being on camera. I was not good at being on camera. And I wasn't about to get paid on being on camera. However, however, I did love teaching people in person. I liked teaching people in person. Teaching through the camera would help me to teach real people a lot better. My solution to a lot of it, since I'm introverted, was to make a lot of faceless. That's right, Roberto was a faceless channel. 
Roberto was a mostly faceless channel for the beginning of my career. 80% of the videos, faceless. I was a faceless YouTuber for 80% of my videos when I got started. That's right. So, like, I think my audience at one point went, like, almost a whole year without seeing my face. Um, so, what did I like to do? I liked making things. I liked design, photography, video editing, art, and I liked helping and teaching creative people. So I liked those things. I was good at those things because I had a previous career in web and graphic design, print design, advertising, marketing, social media. And I helped online business owners while I was working at the company. So I was good at those things. I knew those things were things I could be paid for and would pay well because I became a full-time freelancer. I left the company to become a full-time freelancer, not to become a full-time YouTuber. I became a full-time freelancer doing the things that I was good at. So I, I that I also loved and enjoyed. Creative services. Creative is what I loved and enjoyed. And I was good at creative services profession. So I did that, and I knew I could be paid well for it, and I knew it was a growing market that was in demand. It was a growing market that was in demand. So I had perfect ikigai. I had perfect ikigai. I had the perfect ratio. I had the perfect balance. I had something I was passionate about, a mission that I could fulfill, which is teaching people like me how to make money being a creative professional so that people like me, creative people, people who might be more introverted, people who didn't want to be starving artists, same reason I wrote the book so that people like me could prosper. I'm passionate about that for obvious reasons. When you identify with people, you want them to win. So I'm like, okay, no more starving artists. Creative people, we're the new profession. We're the future. We need to win. We need to be getting this money. We need to learn how to be professionals just like everyone else and not be starving artists. So I had a mission. I knew that it could be a vocation. I knew that I was a professional. And I knew I was passionate about it. So I had Ikigai. And so that was kind of the thesis that helped me launch my YouTube channel. And so what happened was for a good long, I think about a year, let me pull my YouTube channel's old content and I'll show you kind of like how it started and then like where it's at. We'll kind of do a, this is how it started. This is where it's at kind of thing. Um, so let's go. Let's go. Um, let's see. Sort by oldest. Yep, sort by oldest. Okay, cool. All right. And let me answer uh, this super chat real quick. Got Nate bonds thank you for the super sticker i appreciate you uh mommy vision says how long did it take to make the book okay so the book i started writing it um the last quarter of last year so basically a year ago i started writing this probably like i started writing this last october i started writing this probably last october and so it took me a hundred days of waking up every day and writing for a hundred days. And I chronicled it on Twitter to get the first draft. Then from the first draft, I um, let um, maybe 30 people give me feedback on it. Uh, 30 other creators. I let 30 other creators give me feedback on the book. And then I did a second draft. Then um, I took the second draft to my editor, River Chow, who I hired, who's a friend of mine that I made in Clubhouse during the pandemic. River became my editor. We did a paid relationship for the edits. And then a third and fourth draft happened. Then um, I did a final proofing myself, and that was the book, essentially. I worked with a designer uh, Marco over in Fiverr recommended by my good friend, Dale L Roberts, who you all know as self-publishing with Dale. And he recommended, since I loved Dale's book cover so much, I hired his covered artist and he gave me his blessing on that and hooked me up and told me who it was and all the good things. And so I hired Marco and was very happy with the book. I art directed him. And so since I directed him, 
Now, Roberto, you're a graphic designer. Why didn't you design your own book cover? Because I did not need the extra clout from that. Honestly, I just needed the best book that I could get. And I need to focus on the self-publishing aspect myself because while Marco did the interior and exterior design for Kindle, paperback, hardcover, Amazon, Ingram Spark, everything, and did the promotional graphics, I did a lot of the work in the back end, the business side, finalizing it, going back and forth with Amazon, getting proofs done and made, testing out print quality, all these different specifications. I had to do the management piece of it. So the book took nine months to publish. I would argue the book took five, six months to write. It took five, six months to write. And working out all the other details, it took nine months to publish. So I literally had to give birth to this book. <laughs> so that's uh, that was the process for the book. Katrina says, I only have two more chapters left. Thank you, Katrina. And please, please, please rate and review it on Amazon when you finish those last two chapters. Please, please, please. Um, so yeah, so um, back in the old days, here's how long ago uh, Roberto was a YouTuber. I've been a YouTuber like forever, but like, even before this channel, I was a YouTuber before this channel, but there was really no such thing as being a YouTuber, but I digress. But even my early content, what did it start with? My first two videos were about cameras. In fact, I have the camera. This is the first camera I made YouTube videos with. This is the model of the first camera I ever made YouTube videos with. This is a Sony. It's funny that I'm a Sony shooter today, right? This is the Sony um, HD Webby. In fact, actually, I've got a great meme for y'all. I got a great. I got a great meme for y'all. I got a great meme. Y'all gonna love this. Y'all gonna love this meme. This is how it started. This is how it's going, <laughs> how it started, how it's going, <laughs> right? This is, that's the meme. This is how I started. This is how it's going. <laughs> so I started with the Sony HD Webby. And so it's a, it's a flip camera. This is the camera I started YouTube with. And uh, my first videos on YouTube were about this camera. Uh, so it was first one was a quality test and the second one was a Q&A. I think the views, though, are just all people like it had views before back in the day when I was a small YouTuber. But I think the views really are about um, the fact that people wanted to see my humble beginnings because I also talk about how bad I used to be at being on camera. But, and it's, you know, it's funny. I look younger now. I look younger now than I did in these videos and I'm healthier. Probably I think I'm younger and healthier than I was when I made these videos. So that's, what's funny about it is that I feel like I'm younger and healthier um, than I was 13 years ago. You know, it's the only thing I had in my favor 13 years ago, but 13 years ago, I had my washboard abs from being a track and cross country runner. 13 years ago, I had my runner's physique. That's the only advantage. That's the only thing I had going better back then is I had uh, those abs those washboard abs, but I'm gonna get those back. I'm gonna get those back. Uh, cause for the next two years, I'm actually gonna be doing uh training and hopefully Brazilian jujitsu. So I'll just get my washboard abs back. It'll only take two years. Uh, it'll take two years and then I'll be good. I'll, you know, I'll be back in God mode. Um, but yeah, so then I made some videos about my experience. Now, back then we also weren't going hardcore on thumbnails except for because we didn't have custom thumbnails for a very long time. A lot of y'all don't realize this. It took us a while to get custom thumbnails and then you had to qualify for them. So um, we did that. And then after a while, I started doing the Photoshop tutorials. And so you can basically see I mostly became a faceless content creator. So uh, when I say that my audience saw me a couple of times a year, I'm not joking. My audience saw me a couple times a year. So as a small YouTuber, I was doing these. No videos went viral, but this these Photoshop tutorials accumulated a lot of views over time, or at least some of them did. So I was getting views, and you can see why I would grow 
as a YouTuber. Now, you can actually get really far just doing tutorials. There's a YouTube channel that I think has like somewhere between 1 million and 3 million subscribers now that just does Photoshop. I think it's uh, Pix, it's Pix Imperfect. It's like, I think the YouTube channel name is Pix Imperfect. And I believe he has like somewhere between 1 million and 3 million subscribers. Let me check real quick. But, you know, this was what my YouTube channel was like. Um, Pix Imperfect. Pix Imperfect has 4 million subscribers and is mostly a Photoshop tutorials channel. Mostly a Photoshop like tutorials camp channel. So think about it. I, I could have just stuck with this for 10 years and been a 4 million subscriber channel, uh, but I'm not as good as Pix Imperfect, but I do all right. And sometimes I would do speed arts and I would show off like uh, art that I would make and things like that. I actually might use some of my old digital art and take it and make it backgrounds for my lo-fi channel now that I think about it. But I had about maybe when I told people the beginnings of anything I made about, oh, anything YouTube, I only made a short series because people asked me questions in my comments about YouTube. And all I did was I said, here's my video lighting stuff. Here's uh, the best microphone. Here is video editing software, backdrops, uh, how to monetize, and uh, laptops for video editing, which is what I was doing, and the cameras. And then that was it. And I was at like, I was at 10,000 subscribers by then or more. I was at like 10,000 or more subscribers. And that was the only YouTube content help I made back then. And then you can see it's really nothing but Photoshop and design content and showcasing some of my own work. Uh, I started getting into some of the hardware a lot more. People responded to the laptop stuff. People really responded to the Mac versus PC and design stuff. Um, uh, started talking a little bit about uh, time management, uh, did a lightsaber effect, did all these things. And like I was getting views. I was a small YouTuber back then. I was getting views. And you can see that my thumbnail game for back then, except for when I was on, what it didn't occur to me to Photoshop thumbnails with myself in them. I just used photos for a lot of it, but sometimes I would. Um, then I talked about like making money on YouTube. And my little secret was, that, hey, it's not AdSense, it's doing everything else. It's getting clients and it's affiliate marketing. And again, none of that was about growing subscribers. You may have noticed for years and years and years, this is like two or three years in, and I still hadn't told anybody how to get subscribers and grow on YouTube. And so um, this one was about improving the video quality. That was a camera video. That was just a camera video. It had to do with the video quality of YouTube. It was a camera video. And you can see the camera stuff started doing really well for me. So um, the Photoshop stuff combined design and photography because I was good at photography. And some of you have seen my photography. You know that I'm good at that. Um, and I did some other things. And so I talked to people like me, designers, photographers, and artists. And that's what I did. And you can see that I got you know, views on this. I had a few videos with 100,000 views. This lens video got 150,000. So this is how I started. I started by talking about my career and my profession and the things that I knew I was good at. And so I did all the Adobe software. I made all these Adobe tutorials, Photoshop, InDesign, Premiere Pro. Um, I didn't do After Effects, but I am good at After Effects, believe it or not. I showcased some of my After Effects work on the channel before. Uh, things like lightsaber effects and things like that. Uh, particle effects. Ironically, I was better at that than motion graphics type, ironically. And I reviewed a lot of Apple products. I was really starting to get into the Apple ecosystem. I was debating Mac versus PC a lot because I used both for so long. Um, I talked a lot about marketing yourself. I talked about handling difficult clients. Again, here's where I start talking about YouTube. All I did was say thank you for 14,000 subscribers. Then I talked about sponsors because I'm pretty sure I got my first brand deals already. So I talked about it. People were asking me about it because they're like, hey, you had a couple sponsored videos. And I think that was for some of the tech stuff. I got sponsors for the tech videos. And so then I talked about it. Um, and people kept asking. So I was like, okay, I have like 10,000 subscribers. I guess I'll talk to you about some of the things. So... Uh, I started alternating videos, design videos, 
photo uh, and photography and camera videos. Um, I started talking about inspiration. I did some of my own photo manipulation speed art. Some people would actually watch my art and stuff like that. And so I had about 20,000 subscribers when I first told people how to get 100 subscribers. When I first told anyone how to get 100 subscribers on YouTube, which is the first, oh, how to grow on YouTube video I actually ever made, the first video I ever talked about actual YouTube growth, I already had 20,000 subscribers and I already had millions of views on my channel. So I said how to get a million views. I was talking about channel views, not individual videos going viral because I'd never gone viral. I don't care about going viral that much. And so you can see here's more tutorial stuff. Here's more this. Here's more that. Again, I talked about how to deal with negative comments. I talked about how fan funding works in 2015. And then I made this video. I had 30, I think I had 25 or 30,000, 25,000 subscribers, maybe 30, when I told people how to get their first 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. But other than that, you can see I did a lot of camera lens stuff. I did a lot of graphic design stuff. It was the primary thing. Then I screamed and ranted about like why sub for sub is bad. I talked about the ways I'm making money on YouTube. I told people six ways. Now I can tell people a hundred ways. Uh, I talked about uh, merchandise. That was back when I first started with Spreadshop, back what was Spreadshirt back uh, seven years ago. So again, really old school with it. This is how I began on YouTube was I talked about things I knew. I didn't claim to be an expert of everything. I was like, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I would do if I was you. Here's what's working for me. I was documenting my, my um, process, okay? So I was talking about the fact that I was making my money with selling my shirts, doing affiliate marketing. And then um, I talked about you know art and design and Adobe stuff a lot. Uh, I talked about uh, DSLR cameras and you know using that. Um, I started talking about monetization and AdSense. And then... Again, I was doing one YouTube related video a week, but that was mostly by audience request in the comment section. Most of the videos, as you can see, still focused on graphic design and focused on hardware and software tutorials. Uh, laptops started integrating into the channel. This was one of my uh, first free products from a brand, the WD, um, which is Western Digital, my book. They gave me a backup drive. I talked about cameras and I started trying to relate camera equipment to YouTube and teach YouTubers about camera equipment because as a photographer, I knew a lot about camera gear. And you can see how I was using my career, my profession, my expertise a lot when it comes to these things. Here's more laptop reviews. So you can see that the way that I grew on YouTube, I know a lot of people like the joke and meme on me about it, about oh, the best way to grow on YouTube is to talk about YouTube. I got to 100,000 subscribers mostly off of camera reviews, laptop reviews, tutorial videos, and career advice for creative pros who want to get a job in the industry or become freelancers. Um, and so I was making my money because I was a freelancer. Now, what a lot of you don't know is back during this time, I was in what's called a YouTube MCN, M-S-E-N, multi-channel network. And what they were doing is they were taking 50% of my ad revenue, which was not a lot of money. So after they were taking 50%, I was making like $200, $300 a month. At one point, it got up to $500 a month. And like, yeah, they were ripping me off. I should have been making $1,000 a month on YouTube from AdSense. But they were ripping me off and taking 50% of my ad revenue. Because I, as a, a small YouTuber at 14,000 subscribers signed a bad contract and no big YouTubers were warning anyone about MCNs back then. And a lot of people like to say, oh, you act like no one was talking about MCNs. Back in the day, back in the 2010s, no one was talking about multi-channel networks in a negative fashion. Everyone was positively talking about multi-channel networks. And it turns out a lot of big YouTubers were in contracts or were employees of multi-channel networks full time and were doing YouTube part time. And a lot of us didn't know that at the time. A lot of big YouTubers that you know and love today, they were employees of multi-channel networks. That was their day job. And they were YouTubers part time. 
And we didn't know that. And that's why everyone was promoting multi-channel networks. And so I got scammed by a multi-channel network. And that's part of what made me want to help YouTubers a lot. Besides people asking me about it and me saying, okay, I'll just make videos that people in the comment section ask for. I did a lot of live streaming back then, back when it was Google uh, live streaming. It was, um, God, what was it called back then? I think it was called Google Hangouts on Air back then. Yeah, it was called Google Hangouts on Air back then. And this was also roughly around the, I don't know if you guys remember the, God, what was that Google thing called? Was it Google Connect back then? Or what was it? What was it called? It was the thing where they were trying to connect Google and YouTube. I forget about it. Emma Blackery made a song about it and about how bad it was. <laughs> But yeah, so like I had some videos that were popping, but nothing ever went viral. You could argue that they were big for being a small YouTuber under 100K at the time. But yeah, I would even make, um, you know, uh, videos talking about the industry, comparing different software. Um, the budget camera lens stuff did very well. The budget, the budget gear stuff in general did very well for me on Amazon. And so how was I making my money as a YouTuber? I was making $1,200 a month as an Amazon affiliate because camera gear sells really good, sells really good on YouTube. So that's what I was doing and that's how I was making my money and that's how you know I was being a full-time content creator. I was a freelancer who had clients. I had clients on retainer. I think my best client was paying me $2,000 a month at the time. I had freelance writing contracts. So before I wrote the book, I was already a writer. I was writing for... How Magazine, um, Print Magazine, and Creative Pro, and a few other publications. I think I wrote for Blue Line for a while. And so I was making about twelve, fifteen hundred dollars a month on writing. I was making uh, twelve hundred dollars a month or more on Amazon affiliate marketing. I was making two hundred to five hundred on YouTube AdSense at the time. And I had my biggest retainer client paying me two thousand dollars a month. So for you know, for a dude in North Carolina paying 960 a month in rent for a three bedroom making about you know three to five grand on a bad month was doing pretty good for me at the time and then I got to making six figures through my different income streams because in 2016 I started really doing more affiliate marketing and not just Amazon affiliate marketing um and then uh, that would lead to my relationship with TubeBuddy which really changed my life So I started doing YouTube help videos once a week and I was doing four or five other videos a week. I became a daily content creator in 2015, which put me over the top with videos and got me to 100,000 subscribers by the late spring of 2016. And I believe that we have like, you can see that again, camera videos did great for me back in the day. But yeah, I started doing a little series on YouTube related stuff. And then I started doing it once a week, usually not more than once or twice a week, still very consistent on the graphic design stuff, even six years ago. 2016, I spoke at Shutterfest, which is a photographer conference. You can still see how much it was a part of my brand. In 2016, I spoke at How Design Live in 2016, which is a graphic design con. Uh, conference. So this was the beginning of Roberto's career as a public speaker. This was the beginning of my, my career as a public speaker. And then I would become a keynote speaker. As they like to say, the rest is history. This was a channel review series I did. This was a channel review series I did with uh, TubeBuddy. And so the funny thing is, um, a lot of these channels got bigger. Um, Le Sweet Pea, Paris, She's over 100,000 subscribers in YouTube now. Um, and she grew fairly quickly. Socially, Nina works at LinkedIn now. Um, let's see. Geek, uh, Bloodbath and Beyond is over a, a million subscribers, I think. I think they're a million subscribers. Kimberlea is over a quarter million subscribers. Um... Primo Trev was growing, but he quit YouTube. Geekdom 101 is almost to a million subscribers. My friend Owen Video is crushing it. And he's, you know, he's been recovering from his cancer journey. He's doing healthy. The main thing for him is to be doing healthy. 
Charlie Marie, my good friend Charlie Marie, I think she's oh, well over 100,000 subscribers now. Lost Simplified was growing, but it quit YouTube. Um, Epos Vox is over a quarter million. Yeah, Epos Vox was here and was uh, over a quarter million. The Lost Simplified quit. If the Lost Simplified didn't quit, they'd be a big law tuber now. Um, so yeah, I did the channel review series back then. Maybe we'll do another channel review series one day, or maybe that'll be members only content. That might be good members only content. Uh, so might be a good reason to become a member. I got into drone content for a good minute. Uh, I bought, uh, bought a drone. Uh, some of the drone videos did better than others. This was the Microsoft Surface uh, review. This did uh, 675,000. That was good. Uh, the Casey Neistat um, quitting vlogging was, I think, the first time I ever talked about another YouTuber and put them in a thumbnail. As you guys know, I rarely do that. Um, I did talk about PewDiePie and the algorithm in a live stream, I think that was. I think it was a live stream. I rarely use other YouTubers in thumbnails. I'm going to probably do more content around other YouTubers. This was um, a testimonial from Paris about her YouTube channel and a case study on how her YouTube channel grew because she was just so thrilled with it because she went from she went from like 4,000 to 50,000 in like eight months by implementing the advice of my channel. Um, this was a collab I did with Sarah Dietschy. This was one of our first collabs. This was a stream and collab helping my friend Amy Landino back when she was Amy Schmittauer launch her book. And now uh, my book is out. Maybe we need to do a stream together about my book now um, over on her channel. Maybe that might be a thing. Probably just do it on her podcast. Um, I started talking a little bit about drones over here, podcasting. Uh, so uh, this is when the Wall Street Journal did the hit piece on PewDiePie. Here's me and Sarah Dietschy again. Um, here's me, um, talking to Nicole over at social media marketing world back then. Here's me and Tim Schmoyer. So like, you know, this was a little bit of Roberto's collab era. Um, signed Larry Doozy. Yeah. Like 2017 was probably my collab era. Here's me and Sal Sincata. He's the founder at Shutterfest. He's a multimillionaire magazine founder, conference owner. Here's me speaking at Shutterfest back in 2017. I actually went back to Shutterfest this year and took my best photos ever. So like if you break down what my career as a content creator has been like, um, you know, back in my day, uh, you know, this was the journey. Like a lot of people do not show you their journey. And I'm talking about the ups and downs. I'm talking about the monetization piece. Like I said, I got screwed over by that multi-channel network. They were taking like 50% for three, like two, three years. They were taking like 50%. They ended up owing me $4,000 in back pay, by the way. And it took me them three years to pay it off. It took them three years to pay off $4,000. That's how ridiculous that was. So um, that was one of the things that I think made me passionate about helping content creators was just being in that very bad position and not wanting other creators to um, find themselves in that position and become much more self-reliant. Um, when I think about the, how much money they made off of me for years, uh, it's just very frustrating to think about. Um, so yeah, more public speaking. And some of my public speaking was paid. Some of it wasn't. Like half of it was not paid. Some of it paid okay. Some of it paid very little. Um, there's me and Sean Cannell. Um, I try, I did a thing back in the day called creative thoughts. It was kind of a vlog series. Some people still say creative thoughts was their favorite series from me. I'm thinking of bringing it back in a way, but I might do that. Um, we might use the new cine cameras that I bought and we might produce a show, but if we produce a show, I think the way we'll produce the show is we might make it on you screen and we might let channel members have access to it as well. But uh, the way I want to do it now, instead of just trying to vlog, which I was doing, and I was vlogging from my phone. I was also trying to prove that you could make decent content with a phone. So I was vlogging with my phone. I think it was a Samsung or an iPhone at the time. I forget. But I was doing creative thoughts. And what I was doing was I was exclusively shooting and editing it on my phone to prove to people that you can make quality content on your phone. This time we would do 
that kind of vlog style. If we did a vlog style thing, we would um, we would do it using the cine cameras and we'd film it like a show. Yeah, no one ever thought YouTube would actually be a money-making thing. Yeah, back in the day, people didn't think YouTube would be a money-making thing. Absolutely, y'all. I'm going to get to some of the chat here, and I'm going to answer some of your questions, and then I'll walk you through more of the rest of this. Yeah, the original founders tried to start YouTube as a dating site, but thankfully they pivoted, which is why I talk about the importance of pivoting in the book. Yeah, when YouTube first started, it, we all thought it was kind of like America's Funniest Hope videos. Yeah, that was that was how it was. And MySpace and Bebo was good. So was Zynga, if you guys remember Zynga. You guys remember Zynga and you guys remember um, WebJournal? Do you guys remember WebJournal and Zynga? Or am I just super old? Hey, uh, Gil says, hey, you're an OG YouTuber. Love seeing you. Thank you so much. Thousands of people tweeting that they're canceling their PayPal dents. It's easy to tweet. I doubt people will actually do it. And the story time is the reason I trusted to buy the Kindle version first and now the paperback value and growth and journey and proof of it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Chloe says, uh, I remember using windows movie maker in 2006 to make videos for bebo i guess your passions really come back to you. yeah no i remember this i remember this back in the day man bebo bebo was a thing vidler was a thing yeah it was vivo it was vidler i think it was daily motion was around youtube shorts putting the random back in video you should trademark that yeah i should Yeah, the um, the archives will be available. All the stream archives are available. Roberto, I feel seen. <laughs> uh, you wish the background were dimmer and darker? Huh. Eh, it is what it is. Other people like the color. Uh... Yes, sewing report. It is really hard to find an editor that's a good fit. My plan for a video editor is probably to go to the college. There's a lot of good colleges out here is to go to one of the colleges. I'll probably go to like KSU. I'll probably go to KSU and recruit a video editor uh, from there and then a second editor. And that will be um, that'll be what it'll be like. Lead attorney, thank you for becoming a channel member, homie. Appreciate you. Appreciate that. Wow. It's nice to have a big YouTuber uh, here in Atlanta as a channel member. Lead attorney has a great channel, y'all, if y'all didn't know. And he's one of the top creators here in Atlanta. And he always shows me so much support. We haven't even like met yet. And um, you know, he's always really good. Um, all right, we've got a spammer. You know, it's funny with the, the th weird thing with the spammer stuff is we actually have this on subscriber only mode. So they have to literally become a subscriber just so they could spam. But we're going to deal with that right there. Oh, I should do a video on the um, how it started and how it's going. I think I might do that on the more Roberto Blake channel. Um, we might do that. Calming anxiety. I started my podcast with a 25 pound USB microphone from Amazon, a secondhand Lenovo laptop, and now an uh, and now you have an i9 RTC, uh, DaVinci Resolve, Rode Pod mic, and a Zoom L8 board. Good for you. Good for you. That's some top tier gear, and that's like humble beginnings. So, yep, started from the bottom. Now we're here. Yep, it's like started from the bottom. Now we here. <laughs> yeah, so definitely um, a journey. Definitely a journey. Um, yeah, I had locks. I cut them not for any other reason than maintenance. I cut my locks because I'm lazy. So it was just like, it was just a thing. The, the, so yeah, people always ask me all the time, did I cut my locks because of corporate or sponsors or anything like that? No, I did it because I'm lazy. <laughs> like, bruh. 
Locks are maintenance. Locks are maintenance. I, it's like, hmm, I can have the locks or more time to edit videos. Guess which one I picked? <laughs> Lazy. Um. So yeah, I, I, so that's that's a whole thing. Is I've reduced as much of my life as I possibly can to, you know, efficiency and some versions of minimalism. I wouldn't say I'm a full Google Plus. Thank you, Coconut Pete. Thank you, Google Plus. That was the name I couldn't remember. Google Plus. Yeah, Emma Blackery back in the day made a whole song about Google Plus. Appreciate you, Coconut Pete, on that one. Like, Coconut Pete, I know we ain't always, you. we don't see eye to eye on everything. I know you got your conspiracy theories that I'm a secret YouTube employee. Trust me, I'd love to be a YouTube employee and I wouldn't keep it secret. If I was a YouTube employee, I would get so much more clout if I was a YouTube employee. If I was a YouTube employee, I could make videos about being a YouTube employee and I'd have a million subscribers off of the back of that and I'd make a lot more money. Like, just saying. Um, and as for how I make the money, I make most of my money from sponsors. I make over 100K from sponsors, about another 100K, give or take, depending on the recession from affiliates, according to my math, 30 to 40 grand in YouTube monetization, depending on views and how things go, super chats, memberships, all of those things. And then the coaching business, which is people paying for calls with me, which is just a man charging for his time. I make 100K a year on that. Then there's speaking events. I do okay with that. Half of them pay, half of them don't. Most of that expense just goes right back into travel. I pay the team for my coaching business. And so basically all the money from the coaching business pays the team and their salary. So on the coaching business where I trade my time, all the money goes back to the employees basically on that business. And I keep the money that comes from the affiliate marketing on the YouTube channel for the camera gear, the software, those things. And then I keep the money from the sponsorships and the ad revenue, actually not the ad revenue, the IRS gets that money. And so uh, that's what happens. So, um, yeah, you know, that's how it is. And then there's expenses and then there's expenses. So that's how it is. I have the business expenses, the taxes, retirement account, because YouTubers don't get a 401k on there. You have to do it yourself. All the insurance, the business insurance, the travel insurance, the house insurance, the life insurance policy, the accidental death and dismemberment, the liability insurance. It just goes on with the insurance. You actually, if you become a content creator, one of the things no one tells you about is they don't tell you the 15% unemployment, not unemployment, the 15% self-employment taxes on top of regular taxes. Um, if you do sell any of your stocks or crypto, you do have to pay capital gains taxes on top of that. Basically, if you become a content creator as an entrepreneur, you're taxed six different ways. You're taxed six different ways and almost no one talks about that. I bring it up in my YouTube taxes video and I have an updated video to that coming up. Um, but yeah, you're taxed like six different ways. Um, because like when you sell your products, you like, you know, you have to account for the taxes when you sell your merchandise, your products, all of that. You pay sales tax on everything you buy for your business. You do get deductions on some of that, but it's not full deductions or full depreciations. You have payroll taxes. You have your self-employment taxes. You have the FICA stuff. And then on top of that, you have the um, regular taxes that you pay on earned income. And you also have your property taxes. Maybe it's more than six times now that I think about it that you're taxed. It might be seven to eight times that you're taxed, depending on what state you live in, because you have the state and federal. But I live in a state where the taxes are about six or 7%. It's uh, Georgia. But if you lived in Florida, Texas or Nevada, you wouldn't pay the state taxes. You pay much more if you're in California, though. You pay much more in California. Um, the government takes its pound of flesh one way or another. Uh, so there's that part of it. Uh, and in my case, I retired my mother. So that's a big portion, a nice chunk of my income. I wouldn't say like it's a decent enough chunk. It goes to that. And she has a lot of uh, expenses and overhead because she's um, she's up there in age and she's a diabetic. She's still relatively healthy. Recently, uh, she just had a major surgery that restored her eyesight 
that kind of thing's expensive. It's not covered by insurance either. And not everything will be in your network if you're a content creator and you get insurance. The other thing you have to do is you have to be very careful about the network that you get your insurance in and make sure that for whatever your needs or your family members, that's covered in network. Because like when you when you stop being a regular employee and you, you have to pay for your own insurance, that's one thing that a lot of people don't bring up. You pay your own taxes, you pay your own insurance on top of expenses and the taxes are higher. You pay the individual insurance. Now the insurance could be more or less expensive. The insurance can be more expensive. This is one of those more full-time content creator things. The insurance could be more or less expensive because with the group policy from your job, sometimes you don't always get a better deal. The company gets the best deal for itself, not the best deal for the employees individually, even with the group policy. So then you go shopping for your own insurance and then you might get a better deal, but you have to figure out what you're going to do about the coverage, the deductibles, the co-pays, and you have to kind of like figure out what works for you. But the most important thing is to look at what the network is and what is covered under the policy. Because even if you're paying for that insurance, the thing you need may not be covered. And it may not be um, something that your deductible can manage. And it may not be something that's available in network if you want to see a specialist for anything, if you want to see a specialist for anything. So those of you with any type of um, conditions, chronic illness for you or your family, you have to pay real attention to the insurance choices you make as a content creator. This is why some people actually take longer. They keep making more money than their day job. They make more money than their day job, but they don't leave the day job because of the insurance coverage. But what you can do is you could look at and compare the policy that you get in the group plan versus what you might be able to get through private insurance on your own. And sometimes it might be better. Sometimes it might be cheaper. If you're young, you could save money. The younger you are, the more money you save doing private insurance in most cases. You could also just get what's called a catastrophic policy. And if you get a catastrophic policy, you pay next to nothing. Uh, but you're not covered for things that aren't literally a life-threatening emergency in that case. But when you're young, maybe that's the route to go. You just have to think about your finances, talk to your family, talk to your physician, you know, maybe even talk to a financial advisor, look at your funds, you know. But that's another thing about the transition to be a full-time content creator. Now, me, since I was a freelancer, since I was a freelancer, I understood already that, all right, got to have my own insurance, got to pay my own taxes, got to do my own contracts. Got to, I was used to that. I was used to contracts. I was used to invoicing. I was used to insurance. I, I had it under control to the extent because I had had the previous experience freelancing to translate into being a content creator and so since I'd already been an independent contractor, knowing that I'm not an employee of YouTube, not an employee of Google, not with the company, I realized that, oh, I'm a 1099, not a W-2. This is how it is, right? So there's that part. A lot of you also need to be looking at getting an LLC. I have a whole video that I've been making uh, about uh, getting an LLC. Now, it doesn't give you the tax advantages that an S-corporation does. And this is not financial advice, but... The S corporation, if you talk to your accountant or your CPA, they'll tell you that the S corporation is what will save you on the taxes. And that'll eliminate um, typically that 15% self-employed tax that you have. You pay yourself a reasonable salary, you're taxed on that. And you could combine that salary with also payouts from the company. Um, it's called distributions, distributions. And this is a form of uh, pass-through income. This is a form of pass-through income. And so it's taxed at the standard rate. But by having you and the entity separate in that way, you're lowering the taxable amount in, in the bracket for each. So now you're taxed at a lower rate for each one. You're taxed at a lower rate now, you see. That's why these big time CEOs only pay themselves a salary of about 88,000 a year is because, well, that puts their taxable income in a certain bracket. Then they get distributions from the company. They use loans against the equity of their stock assets. Instead, the loans are usually at a lower rate anyway. It doesn't matter to them. They have the capital. They earn more on the interest of their capital gains. The capital gains that they make 
in terms of the compound interest is so astronomically high compared to the very low interest rates they get because of their income capacity, their capital, and their credit score, that it doesn't matter. You don't care about a 3% on a loan when you're making 20% on interest year over year on the asset because you're still up seven. So, sorry, not seven, 17. You're still up 17. So why does it matter? So that's how they do that. And the other thing is the money from the loans is not considered taxable income as well. And so what do they do with that money? They spend it acquiring more assets that generate more. You see the loop. So these are the things we don't know because we, if we're creatives and artists, we don't know about business like this. So when you learn about business like this, and that's the good thing about the fact that I did go to community college. I went to school for advertising. I also took the business and entrepreneurship electives as well. I didn't major in business, but I took every elective for it. I took all these electives that had nothing to do with my major to be much more well-rounded, even as a community college student. And so it gave me certain advantages. The other thing is I learned, I worked for entrepreneurs. I worked for self-made millionaires. I made myself their informal apprentice. Yes, my young apprentice, you will learn the ways of the dark side. Yeah, so I, I, I made myself the apprentice of these business owners. I made, I made myself the apprentice of these Sith Lords, these multimillionaires that were self-made. And I learned from them. I learned, well, how'd you start the business? How'd you found the company? How'd you get your first employees? Hey, as a company, how are we doing? Like, do we, like, what happens as a company if we don't make payroll? Like, if we don't make our sales quotas, if we don't make payroll, well, what happens as a company? Like, I would learn from these things. Hey, I know that you vote this way, boss. Like, why do you vote that way? Oh, it's because of the taxes? Oh, well, tell me more about these taxes. Tell me more about this. I want to understand. And so I would, I would talk to my bosses outside of work and even on the clock and just like sit there. And sometimes I would sit down in the office and they would be happy to just have somebody who took an interest and they would sit there and reveal to me the secrets of the universe. Because I, I think a lot of you do not understand that a lot of people who teach, yeah, we kind of like to hear ourselves talk a little bit, but a lot of times what it is, is if you're passionate about something and you build something, it's very flattering and comforting that somebody wants to learn your trade. And so we all want to pass on our trade. We want to pass on what we've learned. And so it's actually very easy to learn from successful people if you ask them really intelligent questions and you shut up and listen and you don't sit there and pick at them and challenge them about every damn thing. It's actually very easy to learn from somebody richer than you if you ask smart questions if you compliment them and if you know how to shut up and listen sometimes, they will literally reveal the secrets of the universe to you and they will tell you exactly how they make their money, what the tax system is really like for them. They will tell you about property. They will tell you all of these things that you will never learn in school from someone who's actually lived it because you won't learn from a millionaire in school. You're not going to go to a college that you can afford to without already being from a rich family unless you get a scholarship. And learn these things. So when you go and if you actually talk to millionaires and you go to your local small business association and you go to the city council meetings, I used to film uh, the city council meetings, actually. I used to film the city council meetings. I learned about the, the networking and the relationship building and how these people do business because I went to the city council meetings and I went to the local small business association. Because I work downtown, so I, I might as well. And the photographers that I worked for also taught me about these things too. They weren't millionaires, but they taught me about a lot of things. And a lot of them worked for millionaires, and they told me a lot of things, and they made some introductions for me. You can learn a lot by putting yourself in the position of a student if you're willing to put yourself in the position of a student. And you learn under the right masters. A lot of things that you don't know that you don't know are, end up being revealed to you. And... It's actually not that hard to gain this knowledge from them, but you just have to not be a prick who thinks you know everything. You have to be able to shut up and listen sometimes. And that's also what helped me become a public speaker. I went on the conference circuit. I sat in other people's talks. I volunteered. I volunteered for things. And because I volunteered, I learned. And I got a network because I volunteered. And because I volunteered at Social Media Marketing World in 2015, in 2016, I was invited as a speaker on one of the most important stages in the industry in the world after one year of networking. 
because I did such a good job with my rooms and did such a good job for the speakers that all the speakers spoke highly of me and all the attendees spoke highly of me and the other people who worked the event spoke highly of me. They went back to Michael Stelzner and then Michael Stelzner put me on stage next year. And then he put me on stage basically every year after that, except for the pandemic. Um, and so volunteering your time in the right capacity at the right events and for the right people, and it's not hard to know what those right people and right events are. Who's successful? Go to that event. Who's a public speaker? Go to that event. Who's the sponsors? Go to that event. It's not hard. Okay, so that was the answer. So um, that's what did for me. And the thing is, until 2016, and I already had 100,000 subscribers, I already had 100,000 subscribers. I didn't start networking with other YouTubers really until I had 100,000 subscribers. And so at that point, I did stuff with Sean Cannell, who I'd known for, I think, about a year or two by then, a year, probably a year. So I, like, I did that after my first VidCon was 2016. So then I started talking to friends like Evan Carmichael, uh, I started uh, talking to people who weren't just the small YouTubers who grew in my community. I started talking to uh, more of the YouTube educators like Tim Schmoyer, Daryl Eves, Sean Cannell as well. We started collabing together. Um, I collabed uh, with Sean Duras, who a lot of you like do not give enough credit for, and he's huge. He was the first Snapchat influencer. Um, and... Here's someone from my community, John Prosser. John Prosser is a straight up rags to riches story. And we talked in a podcast interview um, about small YouTubers making big income. We talked about his Amazon sponsor deal, his Amazon show they did going on his own, getting front page tech up and running. John Prosser almost quit YouTube. He almost quit YouTube as a small YouTuber. Um, I think he was at like, maybe he was at 20,000 subscribers. He almost quit YouTube. And a year later, he had 100,000 subscribers, but he almost quit YouTube at the wrong time. He almost quit YouTube at the wrong time. I sat in the lobby of, uh, uh, I saw in a hotel lobby, I sat in a hotel lobby after speaking at Chris Perillo's event. And you guys may not know Chris Perillo. Chris Perillo is one of the first people to reach out to me as a YouTube creator. Uh, he's an OG tech creator, and he's actually OG before YouTube, but he founded the tech YouTube space. Chris Perlillo single-handedly created some of the biggest tech YouTubers. He mentored Marquez Brownlee. He mentored so many people in the tech space. He doesn't get enough credit for that. Um, I think he even mentored uh, John Redinger, uh, Techno Buffalo, John Redinger as well. Like, So Chris Perillo gave a lot of people in this industry their start, right? Especially in the tech space. So I was speaking at Chris Perillo's event. He did an event with Adobe in um, Seattle that I spoke at. And I sat with John Prosser for four hours in a hotel lobby and talked him out of quitting YouTube and begged him not to quit YouTube. And uh, we talked about it in the podcast episode. So I'm not speaking out of turn. It's not private conversations. Like we talked about it in the, in the podcast. And I begged him not to quit YouTube. And I begged him to give it more of a chance. And I, I helped him change some things in the format. And I told him, make the tech news show that everybody signs up for. Stop doing these side projects. Stop doing these other types of videos. Focus on the one thing that people love the most and give it like three months of focus. Just focus for 90 days and show up Monday through Friday and do front page tech only and none of the other projects and none of the other shows. Don't do the other shows. Don't do the podcast. Give it another, do it, do the another channel or focus on something like that. But like do front page tech for 90 days and see what happens. Within, I think three weeks, the channel started getting triple the subscriber rate and was blowing up and he was getting all these views by just fucking says, screw giving it three months. Look at the results from three weeks. We're all in on this. Like experiments over. This is it. And and now they're massively successful, massive multiple six figure business. John's a homeowner now, married, uh, has a team, has a staff, has other projects. The podcast has been rebranded to Genius Bar. That's successful. That one's probably going to get a silver play button as well. Like, They've been doing all these things. I remember when they did like 
they did like 10 grand in a merch drop in a week. Like they've been massively successful at front page tech. And it was a, it was something he almost quit on. It was something he almost quit on a few years ago. And there are so many stories like this in the community uh, uh, from people. There's so many um, experience, like there's so many of these different stories. And, and so when I, when I look back at the history of the channel, it's not just the history of the channel, it's the history of the community as the history of a lot of uh, people. I knew Sean Duras because we, when Sean Duras was coming up, we both were speaking at little no-name conferences people had never heard of here on the South and the East Coast. We were sitting here doing all these East Coast conferences. The We weren't getting invited out to California for nothing. And no one cared about Snapchat at the time. And Sean Duras was blowing up in Snapchat. And then it became a thing. Now he's one of the co-owners of Vid Summit, along with Daryl Eves and Mr. Beast. And now he's pioneering this new IP with animation with him and his family. And it's going to skyrocket. And they're building an animation production thing for YouTubers that's going to help YouTubers become immortal, basically, by animating themselves and animating their best hits. And they're basically going to immortalize YouTubers and make money forever. And it's great. Uh, here's Bijou Mike. Bijou Mike might be the next Markiplier. Bijou Mike might be the next Markiplier. Bijou Mike was in my community when he had like, I think 2000 subscribers. And so we talked about how in two years he went from like having like, I think 2000 subscribers and made massive changes. He didn't just go viral or nothing. He grinded the hell out of it. Or maybe it was, maybe it wasn't 2000, maybe it was 20,000, something like that. He like he went from being a small YouTuber to getting 750,000 subscribers in gaming back when everyone said it was saturated then. And then he since then in the last four years went from 750,000, which is already an accomplishment. He's over 3 million now as one of the most beloved gaming creators in the entire community. But six years ago, he was nobody. Nobody knew who he was. And he's an OG member of this community. And so uh, we talked about him, Sarah Dietschy, my good friend, Pat Flynn, Pat Flynn, was somebody I used to read about and listen to his podcast, and now he's become a very good friend. Um, and this is the journey. The journey um, of this is literally over a decade-long journey that I took. People get upset and they, like you know they throw in the towel, they quit too early, they get frustrated, they get sad about their views. And I wasn't always getting views. I just kept showing up. I just kept showing up. I treated it like work. Because that's what it was. It was work. I just kept showing up every day to work. And so I was a daily content creator for almost three years, by the way. I was a daily to near daily content creator for almost three years. That's why I have 1,600 videos. Uh, here's the interview I did with MKBHD. I think he had uh, 12,000 subscribers. Sorry, not 12,000, 12 million subscribers at the time. 12 million subscribers at the time. Uh, he told me himself it was one of his favorite interviews. I asked questions nobody else had ever asked. Uh, we both had these like OG, uh, you know, broke boy cameras back when we got started. Um, you know, uh, he's 10 years younger than me and I look up to him so much. It's like the guy is 10 years younger than me and yet I look up to him so much as a creator. And he's so full of wisdom. And it's, it's great to know how much that he is willing to openly share with the community about how he built his channel and his success and everything that went into it. And so, yeah, I mean, you can have videos like this, do a quarter million, and then you can have another video do 8,000. You know, I mean, that's how it is. And that's not about luck, y'all. That's not about luck. That's about market demand. Like, that's about market demand. There are good days and bad days in the market. Something isn't luck just because you don't control it. That's called life. There's things you don't control, and they're called life, not luck. And we have this culture now and this era in this new age where – the new gods that everyone worships are luck, faith, and algorithms. There's like three big time new gods in the pantheon, and it's luck, fate, and algorithms that everyone worships now. And I'm not about that. I don't believe in those things. Not in that, like, I don't believe in those things in that way. Maybe it's the way I was raised. I don't know. But I don't believe in those things, and I don't give power to those things, you know? Um, was it uh, Tyrion and Varys said that power resides where a man thinks it resides? If you believe in luck, you're at the mercy of Lady Luck, and some and guess what? She ain't you ain't her type. So you're at the mercy of Lady Luck, and oh, guess what? You're not her type. So why are you giving Lady Luck all this power? Why are you worshiping her? You put your you put your thing in fate and destiny. 
Why are you giving up your agency? Why are you giving up your power? You believe that you are beholden exclusively to this. This algorithm is soulless. It doesn't care about you. It's just a damn database. You're giving up your power and your agency to a goddamn database? Really? You know, sorry for not keeping it 100% clean there. You got, got a little angry about that. You're going to give up all your agency and all of your autonomy and all of your free will to a database? So no, I play the game to the best of my ability with the cards that I'm dealt. I win some rounds. I lose some rounds. I win more than I lose. That's how it is. But I keep playing the game and I keep showing up and reporting for work. I treat it like a career. I treat it like a business. Now it's a business that doesn't necessarily demand that I sit in the office 12 hours a day. But I still treat it very much like a business because I take it seriously as a profession and a career. And I believe in the creator economy. I make the content mostly that I think you want to see. I make a few things that are satisfying purely to me. I make what I think, I don't have to always make what I think will get views. I make what I think will serve the audience. I like it to get views. It doesn't always, but that's on me. I don't leave it up to the algorithm. I say, that's my bad. I didn't get the title and thumbnail right. That's not the algorithm. That's on me. I didn't make a thumbnail or title that you would respond to. That's on me. I take full responsibility for how my content ends up. I don't blame the algorithm. I don't blame YouTube. I don't blame God. It's my fault. If a video underperforms, it's not your fault that you don't care about the topic. It's not your fault you didn't respond to the thumbnail. It's my job to anticipate how to best serve you. That is the job of an entrepreneur. That is the job of a creative entrepreneur is to make things that you, the audience, desire, want, and need, and will respond to. It's my job to anticipate that or to ask you and to listen and to deliver. That's my job. I'm responsible for that. I don't blame God. I don't blame luck. I don't blame destiny. I don't blame the damn algorithm. I don't blame a damn database. It's me, period. And I know that that can be emotionally very hard and taxing for a creator, for an artist, for somebody like working their butt off and like bleeding their heart out. I get it. But you have to understand that as an adult, as an adult, all you are is an endless series of your responsibilities as an adult. And I've been being responsible my whole life since I was 12 years old, growing up in a single parent home. I've done nothing but be responsible. That's how it is. Now, not everybody is built for that. That's why this is not for everybody and not everyone will succeed and not everyone will be good at it because there are qualifiers in life for everything. You have to become qualified to live the life you want and to have the career that you want. And so what I did was I put myself in a position to be highly skilled and overqualified. If you want a position, you know what's the best way to get it? Be overqualified. <laughs> If you want something from life, be overqualified. When your expenses are low and you have little to no debt, you don't need to take out huge income to live comfortably. Facts. Living in the South helps. Oh, we got meet Kevin in the house. Appreciate you, Kevin. Kevin, uh, like, Kevin, we still need to do something together sometime. But, hey, it's good to see you here, man. I appreciate you. Thank you for the support. You've always been super supportive. I, I appreciate it. What is the proper way to add links to your videos without violating YouTube policies? This is a great question. So YouTube policies, I've gone out of my way these last this last decade to make sure I'm always in compliance with YouTube policies. That's why I make videos about YouTube's changing policies and I stay on top of them. I actually have Google alerts. I have Google alerts if so that just in case, sometimes I get a heads up on uh, policy stuff from my partner manager or from one of my contacts at the company. Sometimes I get early uh, previews to things and such. You guys are familiar with that. Some of you saw my interview with the VP of Creator Products, Amjad Hanif. And so sometimes I get early uh, access to information. However, something I do is I set alerts for Google and YouTube white papers because I'm always looking at the white papers and the data studies. And I always look at policy changes and I look at monetization policy changes the hardest, but also policy changes because I am sensitive to copyright, censorship, all of these things. 
uh, community guidelines. So the way that you have to do links without violating policies is a couple of things. One, use HTTPS so that it is um, a secure connection, especially in mobile or the links won't work. Number two, you want to verify these links and make sure it's not a sketchy website in any way or website that deals in pi privacy violations or piracy in any way. All right. And as long as you're doing that and you're not linking it to things like gambling or any illicit things, criminality, drugs, alcohol, all those things, as long as you're in compliance with that, you should not have a problem with your links. But if you're linking out to crack software, piracy, privacy violation things, things that dox people, anything like that, like anything like that, then you will have problems in terms of those links. Um, and depending on where you live, you also have to be in compliance with the local government. So I don't know where you live, but you have to also be in compliance with your government to be in compliance with the terms of service. Clover Tax says, I'm still trucking along as far as numbers are concerned. Uh, seen many blow past me, but they don't have the other contacts and opportunities I have. So it's a trade off. I like where I'm at. That's the main thing. You have to like where you're at, and then you don't worry about other people too much. And the main thing is you have to like where you're at. Don't be jealous of other people. Don't worry about other people. And then remember, you have things they don't, they have things you don't. But when you collaborate with people, sometimes you get a little of what they have, and you and they get a little of what you have, and you end up meeting in the middle. Sewing report, you're loving the members only content. Yep, appreciate you. More to come. Cricket MC Gaming started and quit in 2016, but growing now. Yeah, a lot of people that happens. A lot of people start and quit and they start over again. Um, sometimes it's like starting over in college. Roberta Blake should do some content on me and put me in the thumbnail if he wanted to completely self destruct his channel. <laughs> So for those of you who don't get the joke, uh, Clover Tack is a Second Amendment firearms channel. He does a lot of firearm safety content. That community has a lot of challenges. The firearm, the firearms and Second Amendment community, who I support. Um, I mean, I'm in Georgia. Of course I support that. Um, the They have a lot of unique challenges when it comes to YouTube and the YouTube algorithm and the policy time. Now, there's multiple YouTube algorithms. The YouTube algorithm that I am sensitive to is the one that is around violations and policy and community guidelines and the, the violation stuff. So I'm less worried about the algorithm in terms of the one that surfaces content in that way, but I am sensitive to the one when it comes to anything that we might think of as uh, gating content, throttling content, or anything that even might be soft versions of censorship. I am sensitive to that. And I'm sensitive to the AI bot that scans the thumbnails and videos for things like that. And this is not just the firearms community. It's also the cannabis community as well. And I have a lot of friends in uh, both of those communities. I have friends in those communities. I have clients in those communities. Um, commentary sometimes suffers from this. Uh, the first person shooter uh, gaming channels do as well. So a lot of my friends do actually have legitimate problems with the algorithm, but that has much more to do with content potentially being suppressed based on it being borderline content or perceived borderline content. But usually it's false positives on the AI scanning um, for things like this. I have a friend who's a history channel. You can imagine the problems that they've had with videos being taken down and false uh, community guideline strikes for violating policy on history content. You can just imagine this, the nightmare that that's been for them. So there's multiple YouTube algorithms, multiple. And I read the white papers on these algorithms. I also have talked to people who work on these teams over at YouTube. I have other interviews planned with more uh, people if I can get them. I'm trying to get you all more interviews from the people who work at these companies. Uh, I would like to interview uh, not just uh, people at YouTube, but I'd like to interview. I have some uh, potential contacts, former uh, Instagram employees, um, former Patreon employees. Uh, I'd like to get some current people, but getting PR sign-offs for that and having to get them the questions in advance, things like that. It gets very complicated to get these interviews. And you saw with the Amjad Hanif interview, I don't ask softball questions all the time. I ask some pretty like, I, you know, pressing questions and things I think you would want to know. 
And um, it's actually really tough to be a good interviewer. It's it's unimaginably hard. It's very humbling to have to learn to be a good interviewer. And you have to do you have to learn to be really good at shut up and shut up and listen. And it's actually really hard to learn to shut up and listen when you're a content creator and you're used to talking for a living. <clears throat> when you're used to carrying the dead air, it's actually really hard to make sure that you're well rounded in an interview. And if you've never done it, it's one of the most challenging things you'll ever do in your career. And when you have somebody that's high profile, the pressure is on. The pressure is on. Uh, but to be honest, it's easier for me, honestly, to interview a YouTuber with a million subscribers or someone like Marquez with 10 million subscribers than it is to interview somebody at a company um, by a lot, by a lot. Cricket says, Saren, Amy, this is a throwback. Yeah, facts. It's 100... Uh, percent about the journey. Yep. You remember Zanga? Yeah. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. Remember Zanga? Oh, yeah. And y'all remember AOL? Facts. Yeah. Man, then was those were the days. You guys remember? You guys remember when um we would get kicked off the internet by the um by the dial up? You guys remember that? You remember when we would sit there on dial up? Uh, praying that nobody called the house. You remember that? Gaming enthusiast says, I feel like shorts are pulling traffic from my long form content. Reviewing my watch time. Are you, is YouTube ever going to sort this out? They actually kind of have, they kind of have, and they've made what they call the shorts bridge. And so now it shouldn't be negatively impacting you. <clears throat> Yeah, I set sub mode, but they've kind of started figuring that out. Roberto has lead on his lives. This dude's a hero live. Yeah, lead attorney is great. It's great seeing that lead attorney was here. Uh, if he's still here, shout out to you. Um, and uh, meet Kevin. Shout out to all the creators supporting. Appreciate y'all. Um... Yeah, we have self-employment tax. It's 15%. You have your Georgia state taxes. I think my I think it's just over 6%. And then you have the progressive federal income tax rate. So you're taxed on that. So those are the three primary ways you're taxed, even as a content creator. Um, anyone who gets a 1099, anyone who has like self-generated income, that's what's going to happen if you're not a W-2 person strictly. If you're not strictly a W-2, you have the self-employment taxes if you're not an S-corporation. So you have the 15% self-employment tax rate. You have, you know, your uh, FICA, Medicare, Medicaid, all that stuff. You have, um, you have the federal income tax. You have the state income tax. If you live in somewhere like California or New York, you also have municipal city taxes. So if you live in California, New York, on straight up the income, you're taxed four times because you're taxed at the federal level, you're taxed at the state level, and then you're taxed at the city level. Now I live in the South, so I don't, I'm not taxed at the city level because I live in, in the South and my taxes are also cheaper in the South than if I lived in New York or California. So you're taxed on that. Then you have the self-employment tax. So you're taxed four times on your income, but you're taxed, I think six to eight times on your dollars. Because here's the other thing. You're also taxed the sales tax on all of your purchases, including those business purchases that you make for your business. You're also pay, you also pay payroll taxes. So you pay payroll taxes as well. If you have actual employees, you pay payroll taxes. You don't if you have contractors. I have both. I have both. So you also pay payroll taxes. So now we're up to six times you're taxed on your dollar. You're taxed six times dollar. But wait, there's more. Because if you put money into any of your investment accounts, you pay a capital gains tax and you pay it at a federal and state level as well, depending on the state that you live in, depending on the state where you live in. So you're taxed eight times there. But oh, wait, there's more. There's an inheritance tax if you leave anything to people and they have a windfall. There's a windfall tax for anybody if you 
you, you pass away and people get their life insurance policy and all of that, there's a windfall tax. So they get you, they tax you eight times on your dollar, depending on where you live here in America. You're taxed eight times on your dollar, up to eight times on your dollar. And if you pass away, it's up to nine to 10 times. You're welcome. Oh, and you still have potholes when you drive on the street, by the way. You still have potholes when you drive on the street. So there's that. But progress, right? Society. So, yeah. So you could you could be taxed. Now, again, when you get a good CPA, you get a good accountant, they help lower that tax burden. I'm one of those people who believes you pay the minimum legal amount that you're required to pay. So whatever your accountant tells you to pay legally, that's what it is. And it should be as low as possible. And I'm about that life. I'm about paying as little as possible. Y'all think Robin Hood stole from the rich and gave to the poor? No, he stole from the government. He stole back money from the government, the sheriff of Nottingham. Robin Hood stole from the sheriff of Nottingham who was stealing from the peasants and he gave the money back to the people. That's what Robin Hood is. He didn't steal from the rich to give to the poor. That's more propaganda. <laughs> Robin Hood uh, reappropriated the money the government took from people and gave it back to them. That's what he did. Um, and we don't have a Robin Hood. <laughs> like, so that's like, you know, that's the that's the thing. So the tax thing, when you become a full-time YouTuber, what happens is a lot of content creators do not save up for their tax burden. They don't understand how much they'll pay in taxes. They think it'll be a little bit because you get used to as an employee splitting the taxes 50-50 with your employer. Your employer pays some of those taxes. The employer pays some of your health care, all those things. When you become self-employed, it's all on you and it goes up. It's all on you. So now you have more responsibility and the price tag increased. And that is the thing that is not talked about enough in our industry is the financial literacy component, the financial literacy and management component. Now, what big YouTubers do is there's a certain point in your career, and Marquez and I talked about this in our interview, uh, Marquez Brownlee, MKBHD, we did, we talked about this in the interview. And again, what he does is he gives all of that piece to th his financial advisor and his accountants. I have an accountant, but I don't have a financial advisor. I do meet with one at the bank once a quarter and get some advice, but I manage my finances entirely because I have trust issues. <laughs> I have trust issues. I watch and like, and as for my CPAs, my accountants, they give me all the forms and they file everything, but I pay it myself. I do not give them the money and tell them to pay the IRS. I still directly pay the IRS because I saw what happened to Wesley Snipes. And I saw what happened to Steve Harvey. I write the check myself to the IRS. My accountants just tell me how much it is. That's all I rely on them for is to file the paperwork, crunch the numbers. I write the check myself because um, Steve Harvey... And Wesley Snipes ended up owing millions of dollars because their accountants were stealing from them and pretending to pay the IRS. I don't trust nobody. So I just pay the IRS. Oh yeah, Clover, I forgot about property taxes. So you're taxed even more on your dollars for the things you already bought. Yeah, so yeah, we're taxed like 10 times on the dollar. That's yeah, up to 10 times on the dollar. So that's uh, um, Feast for Cornice says, oh, how I miss um, both states, Georgia and Florida. Hey, I'm probably going to retire in Florida or I'll retire back to my um, family's home country of Panama. And that's going to and I, I get to have dual citizenship because, uh, uh, you know, all my grandparents were born in Panama. My mother has a Panamanian passport. My father was born in Canal Zone. So since I'm from an immigrant family, that dual citizenship. And uh, so I'm going to retire. Probably if I don't retire in Panama, I'll become an expat. Probably. So. I'll retire in Panama, Japan, Thailand, something like that. Something like that. If I marry a girl from like a country like Puerto Rico, I'll retire there or somewhere else that's very tax friendly. Uh, the older you get, the more that stuff matters. The older you get, your medical expenses increase dramatically. Some of your cost of living will go down as you get older, especially if you own your property or you own your land and you own it outright, those expenses come down. But most of us older YouTubers uh, in our 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, I'm about to turn 40 in two years. We have to do a lot better with estate planning, tax management, uh, tax reduction, risk reduction, insurance, liability, all these things. And so I do plan 
to actually bring on a certified public accountant uh, to the channel. Um, I actually have some I can collaborate with. I have a tax guy who uh, has been in my community forever, Kamari Ellis, financial rebel. I can bring him on. And we can talk money stuff. I actually could do it on one of these live streams. I could actually bring in um, a tax agent. I can bring in a tax agent if y'all want because Kamari Ellis is a tax agent. So I could actually bring him on to one of these live streams if he's free on a Sunday and he can talk to us about our tax plan and our money in depth as a tax agent. And he can tell us everything we need to do uh, to you know, be in compliance with the IRS, but also how to protect our money. So if you guys want, I can collab with Kamari and I can bring him onto the channel and uh, I'm happy to do that. So report says some people could do a part-time gig that comes with benefits so they can still work on YouTube, but also have the security of a group healthcare plan. A hundred percent. And a lot of people do this. A lot of people do this. A friend of mine keeps uh, her teaching job specifically so that she can do that. How much does an LLC cost? It depends on how you go about it. Uh, you can go through a lawyer you can go through legal zoom or you can go through stripe stripe is one of the faster ways to do it and it'll probably cost you like $500 to expedite it $500 to expedite it they'll incorporate you it, usually if you live in the states they'll incorporate you like in delaware which will also help you potentially during uh you know for some reasons and some tax stuff um it also when you incorporate an LLC, sometimes you want to have a filing agent do that. And that's why you might want to use Stripe because if you use Stripe, they do it through a filing agent and then that protects your privacy because then the LLC is not registered with your home address. Because if you get an LLC, do not register the LLC with your home address. This is what you know leaks people's privacy. So what you want to do is you don't want to register an LLC with your home address. You want to register your LLC with an a registered agent on your behalf and you want to probably incorporate it somewhere else, maybe Delaware, maybe Nevada. And so you can do that. <clears throat> and yeah, you want to talk to an attorney. You want to talk to a CPA. Sometimes you can get a free consult. Sometimes you can talk to your local small business association, go to your local small business association downtown and they can help you with a lot of this. They can help you with a lot of this. This is how you become educated about these things. Uh, you can't like not everything is going to be explained clearly on Google. Yes, I understand. Oh, everything's a Google search away. Everyone, everything can be learned for free on the Internet. Sometimes you need to go in person, sit down with someone who can explain it in a way that you understand. And that's um, that's important. Oh, y'all get free healthcare. Yeah, uh, uh, I did a collab with uh, Sarah Renee Clark. Uh, she's an artist. Um, yeah, she was telling me y'all get free healthcare in Australia. That is enviable, but you know, uh, check out not your dad's CPA, but your own situation is so personalized. It's not a good idea to solely rely on info you find online facts. That's why you should talk to someone local. That's why you should talk to someone local. This is also why you get one-on-one -on -one coaching. Like, Broad information is so broad. Sometimes you can learn from broad, free information on the internet on your own. Sometimes your own situation is so specific, though, that you need one-on-one -on -one help. And sometimes you need it from somebody that has the lived experience that matches your lived experience, but is a little bit ahead of you. That's important. On the wire says, I built a 26 employee company and then lost it all in 2020. I'm so sorry to hear that. Now I'm navigating bankruptcy and they're piercing the so-called corporate veil. Oh, that's absurd, and that's not fair, and that's not right. A lot of people lost their businesses in 2020 uh, to the pandemic. A lot of people still have not been made whole. It's unreasonable and it's unfair what happened to you on the water, and I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I hope you and your employees are okay, and I hope it all ends up uh, working out. That sucks. That sucks, but I see a lot of that happen. Uh, here in Georgia, there are a lot of businesses that went under. Some of them converted to online. They started e-commerce. They did a lot with um, uh, Shopify. A lot of them did that. 
The KM family says, Roberto, just wanted to say thank you for all your knowledge you share. You're such an inspiration cooking dinner, but just wanted to tell you I'm loving the book. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Please make sure you're supporting the book. Get it on Amazon. Uh, link is in the description. Uh, you can find it. It's called Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from Their Passion in the Creator Economy. Or you can type in my name, Roberto Blake, and you can find it on Amazon. If you've already read it, please, 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 everyone who's already read it, rating and review. Please, 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 Amazon rating and review. Or if you can also review it on Goodreads, that helps me a lot. You have no idea. It helps me so much when you all do that. So please definitely make sure you're supporting the book. I appreciate y'all. Um, Let's see. Yeah, Cricket, you, uh, that's when you met me was at Chris Perlow's event in Seattle. Yep. I'm also glad to see so many of you interacting with each other in the comment sections. Yes, do not rely on YouTube, Reddit, and Facebook groups for tax-specific business advice. That's why I have a CPA. CPAs, tax agents, all these things. Talk to people. Talk to them. Also, the local laws for different states are different. And again, some cities have municipal taxes, but there's also benefits if you go to your small business association, you might qualify for different things. You might qualify for uh, some loan forgiveness or some grants as a small business owner in your local community or a woman-owned business or a veteran-owned business or a black-owned business or minority-owned business. You know, there's all kinds of things. So many of you as content creators do not think of yourself as entrepreneurs and you should go to your local small business association and get resources. There are resources in your Mocha Small Business Owner Association. And almost no YouTuber talks about that. The biggest YouTubers, the biggest YouTubers don't hardly ever talk about anything like this, by the way. I know everyone's like wants to just listen to the big YouTubers. I know everyone wants to hear it come from like a Markiplier or a PewDiePie. But when are you ever going to hear like a 50 million subscriber YouTuber talk about their taxes? They're not. And I don't blame them. It's massively private, it's massively uncomfortable. But if everyone think about it, if think about it, everyone would listen to the biggest YouTubers to some extent if they were talking about their taxes, if they were talking about how much money they make a year and breaking down their income streams, if they were breaking down their creator journey year by year for two hours, if they were telling you about whether they have an LLC or an S Corp. Yes, everyone would listen to the 10 million subscribed channels if they were talking about that. But even when they go on to podcast, that's never the topic because that's not an interesting story. So even if you wanted to, you couldn't learn from the biggest content creators because they're not gonna teach it. They will teach you the thing that they're known for, which is their cinematography and camera gear. They might even teach you their video editing style. They might tell you about camera gear, microphones, lighting. Although you can learn that from other sources, you don't need to necessarily hear it from them. And they're always not technicians. Exceptions are like MKBHD, the biggest tech YouTuber. He's someone you could definitely learn the tech side from as well as anybody. And he knows the business side and stuff, but he also outsources a lot of it. Um, but also people do not watch him for business advice, even though he's capable to give it. The, he told me the secret to a channel like his and most of the big YouTube channels, the secret to the 10 million YouTube channels is they're supposed to not make it look like a business. They're supposed to not make it look like a business. That's supposed to seamlessly happen in the background and it's supposed to have the illusion of not being a business. It's supposed to have the illusion of not having 20 employees. That's how the big YouTubers are supposed to operate. They're supposed to do that because they're the new television. You don't see the cast and crew on TV. You see it in the documentaries. You see it in the behind the scenes. You know, you see it if you go and you go live on set, but we're, we're not, we're, they're not supposed to reveal the magic trick. You know, those people are performers. We're not supposed to see how the magic trick happens. Now, that's where the middle tier YouTubers like myself and the other YouTube educators are valuable is because, you know, we're not like 10 million subscribed channels that are there for the spectacle and that you're watching for the illusion. You're actually watching us for the behind the scenes and the breakdown and the deconstruction. You're watching us for that. You don't actually watch the biggest content creators for their business savvy or their technic or them as a technician talking nerdy to you about tech, unless it's their channel, unless it's tech, unless it's tech, like tech YouTube, that's different. 
You see what I'm saying? That's why the best like tech YouTuber that I like listening to for business advice is Linus Sebastian, better known to the rest of you as Linus Tech Tips. Linus Tech Tips is the most transparent YouTuber uh, above 10 million subscribers about the business side of YouTube and the employees. The employees are somewhat featured on the channel and things like that. Um, we've seen their data center, their camera cage, but he also is Linus Media Company and he's been running it like a media company for years and he wrote the protocols for his company and he runs it like a true company. Linus is the corporate YouTuber. Linus is the corporate YouTuber. Linus is running a corporation and he has his own platform called Floatplane. Linus is a tech entrepreneur. He's a media company entrepreneur because he has his own tech platform and he has his own things behind that and resources behind that. And he runs a media company and uh, basically a media journalism type company, a tech journalism type company as a media brand. He is up there with TechCrunch and CNET and so on and so forth. Linus Media Group is that in the modern era. And that's why one of the main reasons I respect him so much, and it's not about his 10 million plus subscribers on YouTube and him being you know, so high on the clout game. It is because he is a genuine, real entrepreneur and he learned at the feet of real entrepreneurs when he worked as an employee as well and he modeled what he liked from corporate and he modeled what he didn't like from corporate and he made what he wanted to make he took what he liked he got rid of what he didn't like and he's a real businessman he's a real businessman he's not pretending to be on youtube he really built it from the ground up he really did and he's one of the only people who talks about the industry and how his company works as a big youtuber over 10 million in a very can't in a very candid way in a very candid way and so uh you know shout out and respect to linus sebastian aka linus tech tips you know and he's uh one of the ogs in the tech space as well quiet phoebe so yeah so like that's a that's a whole thing Um, does Evan Carmichael get money for a collaborative video? No, you don't pay people for collaborations, or at least I don't. I think that may be a thing. I think that might be a thing, but I don't pay people money for collaborations and people don't pay me money for collaborations. In fact, actually, I think people have tried. I think people have tried to pay me to collab on the channel and I've said, hell no, absolutely not. Um, many of you know, I don't do a lot of collabs. I'm very protective of, uh, the brand. I'm trying to do more collabs, but I'm doing a lot of them in the form of interviews. Excuse me. Uh, probably time for me to eat dinner. Um, so so for me, uh, I do collabs sparingly, but I plan to do more interviews. I plan to do more interviews. Um, how did I manage being daily? Actually, I can tell you a lot about that and I can show you also. So how did I manage um, daily? Well, the way I was able to manage daily when I was doing that, which is more like in the past, it was before I moved to Atlanta. It became hard at when I was moving. When I was moving, I couldn't be daily anymore. And that was the beginning of not being daily as much. Um, so that that became kind of a, a problem for me. But the reason I could do daily is the same reason that I could go back to daily now, honestly. I could go back to being a daily YouTuber now, except for one little problem. Back then, I had much more time on my hands and I was younger. So those of you who are in your late 30s or in your 40s, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Once you hit 35, you might start to slow down a little bit. And so the last couple of years, I've slowed down. I've missed a step, so to speak. They're like, the further into your 30s, the 40s, unless you get a trainer or you work out or you do martial arts, I'm going back to training. I'm going to get um, I'm going to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu near my house and I'm going to the gym up the street now. So my energy and stamina levels are coming back and that, that's why I'm also making more content again. So it's not just about efficiency and time freedom. It's easier when it's your full time gig as a creator, it's easier when you don't travel every month. So I had two things happen. I started traveling literally every month for the public speaking side of my career. I started my coaching business, which required me to do group coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching every week. So what y'all don't know is I take one to two one-on-one -on -one coaching calls a week 
between uh, 30 and 90 minutes. So I can take uh, one to two different coaching clients once uh, to twice a week, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I do calls that could be, I could do as many as three to four calls a week, but it's usually only one or two, right? So I'm booked for private coaching. That can be exhausting. I do two to three office hour sessions every week with my coaching group in awesomecreatoracademy.com. Okay, so I do that. That's exhausting. I started doing that in late 2017. Um, I did it much more heavily during the pandemic, believe it or not. That's also what I think accounted for my pandemic bump in revenue. So the thing with me is all of that plus travel plus moving three times because I moved to Atlanta, then the house I moved into, they wanted to sell the house. So then I had to move again. Then I moved during the pandemic because that landlord didn't want to fix the roof or the HVAC. And the HVAC had a problem, a leak that I believe ended up resulting in killing my two dogs. So that's why Tugboat in Rio passed away. Tugboat in Rio passed away because of the water runoff from an HVAC issue. And so then they both died of cancer. So both of my dogs died. So that was a rough process as well. And that slowed me down too. So between um, dealing with landlords and moving houses and, you know, buying a house over the years um, since moving to Atlanta um, at the, at like tw in 20, the end of 2017, um, all of those things, multiple deaths in the family and funerals to go to a lot of different new responsibilities in my life. Those things all took their toll on my physical stamina and my mental health. And that's when I stopped being a daily content creator. And then I slowly ended up going from making 150 videos a year after that, which still would grow me by like 100,000 new subscribers a year. I was growing by 100,000 new subscribers a year. A lot of people don't remember that. And then all these things started happening in life and it slowed me down and then I went to 100 videos a year. And then 100 slowly became 50 videos a year. And so now I'm in the pandemic rebound now of trying to go back to 100 videos a year. And now that's where my upswing and my comeback is happening. And so, but how was I able to be a daily content creator all those years? It was a couple of things. One, I batch recorded all my content. I only talk about things I knew. I, took about, I talked about camera gear I owned, things I physically had. So that was easy. It was easy to make my four tech videos a month for Tuesday, Tech Tuesday because I was I had a schedule. So my schedule was I was doing Tech Tuesday and I was doing Design and Marketing Mondays. So I was doing Design and Marketing Mondays, Tech Tuesdays, uh, like Photography Wednesdays, Tutorial Thursdays, and YouTube Fridays. And then on the weekends, I was streaming on the weekends. Uh, so I was streaming on the weekends. There was actually a small stint where on Sundays I would do Game of Thrones content on Sundays at midnight with my audience. So, because like I was, you know, back then you could do more random things on YouTube or do a variety of content in the that era of YouTube. That was years and years ago. That's over. Now you got a niche down, uh, unless you're a personality and that's super rare, right? So, how was I daily? I was daily because I had a schedule. So, the easy thing was I could make the graphic design and career advice videos on Mondays, what you could call marketing Mondays. So I could do marketing Mondays really easy. I could batch record three or four of those in a row and be set for the month and schedule them in advance. And I scheduled them two to three weeks ahead. So marketing Mondays, easy. Tech Tuesdays, because the B-roll was a little bit harder, but it, I managed it. So Tech Tuesdays wasn't that hard either. I could always stay one to two weeks ahead of Tech Tuesdays. Batch recording. Um, you know, photography and camera Wednesdays, that was pretty easy. For me, the hardest thing to do because I kept trying to step up the quality and you have to get the steps in the right order and screen recording, editing the screen recordings and the audio was a little rougher. Um, tutorial Thursdays was a little harder. Tutorial Thursdays was a little bit harder, but I did that and that's where the Photoshop and video editing tutorials became a staple of the channel. Then um, YouTube Fridays. And then the weekends we'd live stream and that was how it was. So that's how I did it. I was streaming on the weekends and I was making videos Monday through Friday, but I was batch recording them. So what I would do is I could record four videos 
for whatever day it was in a week, in a day. And I would have recording days and I would have editing days. So I would have two recording days, two to three recording days. And then I would have two to three editing days. And I would do very light work on the weekend. I kept my weekends to myself mostly, but I would stream on the weekends. And that was that. I would stream on the weekends. And basically, you know, I would go hang out with my friends Friday and Saturday night. But then I stopped wanting to drink. Um, I started really cutting back alcohol, almost getting rid of it entirely. And so then I wasn't hanging out with my friends on the weekends as much because I wasn't drinking anymore. And they were really into drinking. So I was like, no, I kind of want to, you know, stop drinking. I want to be productive. Alcohol has no real benefits. You guys, you know, drink a lot. I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, so it was that. Um, I got bored with the club scene. Uh, you know, <sighs> There were some, you know, there were a couple of girls and I would spend time, but I was like working really hard on my career. And so a lot of times that wouldn't last because it's, you know, the career was competing with attention that people wanted from me. So I gave up a lot of relationships because time, I gave up some of my friendships because I was saying no to things. I didn't want to be around certain things. I wanted to live a sober like existence for the most part, you know, so when you decide that you want to like be sober, it's very hard sometimes to keep some of your friends and relationships when that's a big part of their lifestyle. So for me, I was like, no, I really am not interested in that. No, I'm not really interested in the club culture. No, I'm not really interested in hookup stuff anymore. No, I'm really past all of that. I'm like, uh, guys, we're, we're, we're getting too old for it, blah, blah, blah. So I want to focus on business and career and networking I'd rather go to events. It's like, hey, why don't we go on a trip instead? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Oh, I don't have the money, blah, blah, blah. You know, people um, were priced out of certain experiences. So then it became, I would go on vacation with my friends a couple of times a year. I'd go on vacation with uh, my family members. And that was what I did in terms of free time. Whenever I did that, I would have a really rough week because I would batch record a week of content and then I'd go on vacation physically for a week, but no one would know because the channel would still be up instead of live streaming. I would have videos that would go up scheduled instead. So from a time management standpoint, in terms of how I managed the daily, it was mostly batch recording a back catalog of videos that I could put up anytime that I filmed weeks in advance. And I would do that. And then I could do days off and go on vacation. I'd stream on the weekends. And it was because I simplified the process of my content. Most of my content was done in the commentary style. So that means I had a minimal reliance on B-roll. Editing was editing out my mistakes, and I took the approach of a public speaker and performer. And even now, I actually want to reduce my reliance on B-roll and editing, and I want to be more like Patrick Met David and more like um, Chris Doe. I want to be much more as I get older. As I get older, I'm two years away from 40. I do not want to make YouTube videos the way 20-something-year-olds make YouTube videos. And no offense to anybody, by the way, but the way the 20-something-year-olds make YouTube videos is they grew up watching YouTubers, and YouTubers think that what makes them special is their editing style and their personality. I am an education, borderline edutainment channel, but much more education than ed edutainment, 80-20. Um, so for me, I believe that I will be much more like Pat Flynn, Chris Doe, Patrick Bet David, in terms of the production side, Gary V, but that's more on D Rock than it is on Gary V. That's much more on his producer. So much more like the way David Rock produces to Gary V's content. So much more like Gary V's team. I want to do what Gary V's team does. I don't want to necessarily do what Gary V does. No offense to him, and I love Gary V, but I don't want to do what he does. I want to do what his team does with the content. So I want to do what his production team does. I want to do what Chris Doe in the future are doing or something more similar to that in terms of production and not relying on editing. And I want to do what Patrick Bet David does in production where they don't rely on editing. 
And I want to rely more on my experience. I want to rely on things like set design. I want to design, I want to do interviews. I want to become a great interviewer. I want to become a great presenter. I want to be an even better public speaker. I want to be able to do commentary style videos in my genre of creative entrepreneurship and creator economy. I want to do things that look more similar to what Colin and Samir are doing. I don't want to over rely on editing. And where we rely on editing, I want it to be my custom graphics that me and my team develop and rely a lot less on B-roll. And I want us to rely more on conversation style videos. And so what helped me was the fact that I was doing conversation style videos. I wasn't relying heavily on B-roll, not relying heavily on my edits. My edits are sharp and I rely more on production value. So I'd rather be production, performance, and personality and less editing. I'd rather rely on production, performance, and personality and the quality of my information and much less on the editing. However, I do understand that editing lets you, to some extent, stand out and it makes the audience that typically watches YouTube videos, which are massively edited, it does make them respect you. So that means that on sponsored content in particular, two to three times a month, maybe four times a month, we're going to do the edited highly production videos with the green screen like I did recently. So um, like once a week, the hope is that we do a video that's much more edited. I want to show y'all two minutes of like a previous video that we did on the channel. I think it's the last video besides this that we put on the channel that was heavily edited to show you the standard we're going to do at least once a week or three times a month on the channel. We'll do this once a week or three times in a month. If it's a super short video, we'll edit with this style. But I'm going to show you two minutes of what a highly edited video uh, for my standards is like. Uh, so let's watch that video together real quick. Get rid of your intros immediately if you want to grow as a small YouTuber. These intros are killing your retention rates and making your videos underperform in YouTube. You need to get right into the content, deliver value immediately because you only have about eight seconds before you lose the viewer forever. Number two. Focus 80% of your attention on editing to retaining your viewers in the first 30 seconds of the video. This is make or break for your video because you could lose anywhere from 30% to 50% of the audience in the first 30 seconds of your YouTube videos. To get better retention rates, what you want to do is make sure that you're using audio and visual cues and proper editing techniques to keep the pace moving and to get that content right in front of your audience in that first 30 seconds in a way that's impactful and makes them want to watch the rest of your video. Number three, stop making selfish content. The only way to really grow on YouTube is to wait for it, actually make videos that people want to watch who don't know who you are and don't really care. And as harsh as that might sound, if you are a small YouTuber and you may want to feel like, well, I want to express myself or I want to be authentic and all of those things. Authenticity is important. Expressing yourself and your personality is important. Do that in the context of the content itself. But when it comes to the topic that you are choosing, you have to put the audience first. YouTubers who put the audience first will win. Make it about your target audience and not about you. And then you will have a better chance of getting views for your videos. There are videos on this channel that I know will underperform because they're not always in alignment with the core audience. They are sometimes another audience that I might be trying to build and that will get less views. I know which videos will get 50,000 to 100,000 views and I know which ones will get 10 to 20 thousand. If you want to grow on YouTube, prioritize topics for the largest overall audience in your niche possible. Just make the videos that you know they want to watch. Number four, audio is more important than videos. All right. And so that is for everybody. That is what a heavily edited video looks like. And so we're only going to do those. Those will not be the standard for the channel. Those will be like a every other week video one they're good from a portfolio standpoint they're great for sponsors they showcase what i'm capable of and they remind everyone that i actually do know what i'm doing and i'm a great editor and that i mastered adobe premiere pro they're great for my adobe relationship with them for my premiere pro after effects and audition skills and so we'll show off like you know 
if not every week, we'll show off every other week. And so we'll do show off content. But the thing is, the information is still good without all of those effects. It's just, it is what it is. People respect that. So sometimes I'll do it. And, you know, it also shows people that I actually can do YouTuber style content and I haven't fallen off. So all that being said, um, the way I did daily content was not doing things at that quality or level. Now I could do it now with an editor easily. That's the thing. I can go daily with all kinds of crazy levels of content. I'm building sets in the basement. There are different set designs in the basement. There's three sets in this office, honestly. There's like, I think you guys can kind of tell with the switcher that there's multiple sets in this office. You know, you have the bookcase set, you have the, the couch set, you have all, you, you know, there's the table, you got all, you got, you know, you got three or four, you have the whiteboard set. There's like three or four different sets in this office, but I can do more with them over time when I have um, a full-time editor, it will make things considerably um, easier. But what I did without a full-time editor was I kept everything simple. And so I was putting out 30 videos a week, uh, sorry, a month, 30 videos a month, but it was taking me 40 hours to 60 hours a month, 40 to 60 hours a month to do the work which means I was doing in a month the level of work I would do in my corporate job in a week. And I had client work on top of that. However, now to make my videos, every video I make takes two hours at a minimum and those heavily edited videos take 10 hours. So if I do four of those uh, heavily edited videos in a month, it'll take me 40 to 60 hours just for those videos. And that's what some people might call quality over quantity, but it doesn't work on my channel and it typically doesn't work on education channels. Education channels can't do quality over quantity and the quality of that is really the value. So what happens is education channels don't have to go high quality edits. What they do is they do high value content and they do high volume. So education channels, like if you were doing an English to Spanish education channel, you don't need to become a better editor by a lot. You just need to be decent at the editing, passable at the editing, and you have to have good production value. But what you have to do if you're an education channel, like let's say you're a language learning channel, high value, high volume, high value, high volume. That's the formula for an education channel. By the way, the proof's in the pudding. My channel grew when I went daily, and it grew by 100,000 subscribers every year. If I had done that during the pandemic, I would be a million subscriber channel now because I only put out 50 videos a year during the pandemic. That's where the quote-unquote falling off is. I'm at 50 videos for the year now, and we still have the rest of the year. So my goal is to get back to 100 videos before the end of the year, and then next year, 100 quality videos to 150 quality videos, including streams. So 100, 150 is going back to my baseline. I believe that takes me back to 100,000 plus growth year over year again as we go for the gold play button because now, now we're going to go for the gold play button. We're going to go for the gold play button. We're going to sit some people down. We're going to do it. We're going to build the community around the creator economy. We're going to build this channel. You heard it here first. That's right. At the end of this year, the journey to the gold play button starts, but I'm not going to do it in a year because I'm not going to kill myself to get a gold play button. But 2023, the journey begins. The journey to the gold play button begins in 2023. So I need you all not only to subscribe, but y'all, y'all on the live streams, you're the real ones. I don't just need you guys to subscribe. I need you sharing every video with your friends. I need you sharing in Reddit. I need you sharing in Facebooks. I need you advocating for this channel. I need you guys to be, you know, recruiting for the channel as loyal foot soldiers and subscribers, I need y'all to recruit. I need every subscriber here to bring 10 subscribers back. <laughs> like that's that's what I need to happen here. Uh, and I need y'all out there doing that, especially with the live streams. I need y'all recruiting. I need y'all giving the value. I need y'all sharing the value. And so that's the plan. The plan is, the plan is to ask the loyal subscribers to bring more subscribers, to bring more creators, to help more people in the creator economy, to grow the community, help more people get monetized, keep people aware of YouTube policies, because we're going to be covering the YouTube policies heavily for the 2013 changes. There's going to be new rules and guidelines for monetization. There's going to be new brand safety and community guidelines. There's going to be new advertiser guidelines. There's going to be, unfortunately, new restrictions as well. 
We'll talk about that when it comes. I hope there won't be new government regulations, but I'm hearing that there will be. I think we'll see additions to COPPA now. Ad amendments to COPPA is more accurate. So maybe I bring on the YouTube lawyers. There's going to be more collaborations. I'm going to be bringing on the law tubers. We're going to have a panel. We're going to be doing all kinds of things. So in 2023, the journey starts to the gold play button before the end of maybe 2025, 2026. So we're going on a journey. We're going on a journey of growth again. We're going to grow again, and I'm going to take it seriously again. And that means 100 videos a year, 100, 150 videos a year, as long as nothing really bad in life happens, you know, like a global pandemic or a health crisis or something like that. And we're going for the gold play button now. We're just, it's time. We're going to do it. So that's happening. So really actually excited about that. Get that off my chest. We're going for the gold play button starting next year. But I'm going in with a plan. I'm going in with a plan. Uh, basically, the plan is to get back to doing slowly work my way up to doing 10,000 new subscribers a month again and then go back to my peak of 15,000 new subscribers a month. And if we do that, we know that over a period of time by holding it down, we'll get a gold play button. And the thing is, I'm not planning to rush or try to grow. I'm telling you my sober plan. My sober plan for this is making up the three years I lost during the pandemic. That's the sober plan. The plan is in 2023 to say, okay, we're post-pandemic now. Everything's different. And now the three years that I lost during the pandemic, we're going to go back. We're going to take the three years that I lost during the pandemic back, and that's how I'm going to accomplish it. Now, again, if we get there, if we get to X amount and we don't get to the gold play button in the three years post-pandemic because we lost three years during the pandemic, we'll just keep going until we do. And that's how it is. And I'm fine with that. But it's fun to have a goal sometimes. It's fun to have a goal sometimes. Um, Mommy Vision says, how do you know if this is for you? The best way to know if this is for you, the real answer to this is to try to go weekly and try to see if you can do one to two videos a week. And the way to do this is to commit to say, no matter what the subscriber count is, no matter what the subscriber count is, the goal is to commit to say, I'm going to make 100 videos. I'm going to make 100 videos on YouTube, and when I've done that, I will know that I gave this an honest shot and that I tried to learn to be a YouTuber and that I learned to do, and this has to be 100 intentional videos, not posting just to post, not randomness. It's 100 videos that you are committing to and committing to doing strategically, thoughtfully, intentionally, and you're not just making them just to make them. You're making them to learn, but you're making them also to see if you have what it takes to understand an audience and deliver for them. And you commit to doing that for 100 videos, and then you'll know whether you like editing, whether you like being on camera, whether you like dealing with the comment section. You will know if you like YouTube after 100 videos one way or the other. Because the thing is, there's not a point in doing YouTube if you're not enjoying the process of doing YouTube and being a YouTuber. So that will help you know if this is for you or not. But do keep in mind, there are downsides. YouTube can be lonely sometimes. People will not understand. They'll be like, why are you doing this instead of not hanging out with me? Blah, blah, blah. Like I said, like I said, I had to you give up things and give up you know, hobbies and give up friends to do this. Uh, when do you think it's time to expand the brand and start a second channel? This is a great question. So I think it's time to expand the brand and do a second channel when you want to do something that has a completely different audience or that has different sponsorship opportunities. So I'll give you a primary example. I like streaming a lot and I like interviews and I like podcasts. They don't always fit the audience and not every interview will fit this audience that I want to do. And I want to do more interviews. So I started the podcast. Not every time that I want to live stream, will that help or be in the best interest of this YouTube channel? So I started the podcast channel, but I also started the podcast channel to be its own brand. I started the podcast channel to be its own brand. Now, the thing that I could do every day, the thing that I could do every day, if I really want to make time for it, and I might in December again, I might in December again. So instead of Vlogmas, I might do Podmas. I might do Podmas instead of Vlogmas. And I might podcast every day in December uh, it, when I, if I don't travel for vacation, because I don't think I'm going to do vacation this year. Um, but 
I also branded the podcast, the Create Something Awesome Today podcast, and it now ties to the brand of the book. So I was strategic in building another brand because I also knew I was going to write a book and I knew what I was going to call it. So a second channel could let you do more sponsors, could let you monetize differently. Let's say if I had a gaming channel, if I had a gaming channel and my gaming channel was successful and I was getting views and subs and I had a community and all this, but my gaming channel wasn't making the money that I like. I was like borderline full-time or I was full-time. If I was a full-time creator, but barely a full-time creator and I was a gaming channel and I felt vulnerable on monetization, I'd start a second non-gaming channel in a more profitable niche and then make the non-gaming channel so profitable in this other much more profitable niche that it could cover my living expenses and rent so that now I wasn't relying on the gaming channel's monetization because the gaming channel's monetization would be much more restrictive, much more limited to be able to keep the audience because it's a different culture. So if I was a gamer, I would get successful and yeah, maybe I go full time or whatever, but then I would almost immediately start a second channel that's easier to monetize. And for me, that'd mean I'd probably do a podcast, but I wouldn't do the podcast about gaming. I do the podcast about something else that I'm interested in that is in a high paying niche that I actually like and that I'm knowledgeable or enthusiastic enough or something that lets me do interviews with people. And then I would do that. So if I was gaming, if I was gaming, I would do a tech podcast. So if I was a YouTube gamer, I would do a tech podcast because some of my audience might actually care about the hardware part of the industry and might care about the industry and care about companies like NVIDIA and AMD and Intel and what they're doing or care about what Nintendo does as a company. So if I was a gaming YouTuber and see here, here's the advice that gaming YouTubers wanted so much and need so much sometimes. If I was a gaming YouTuber, I start a tech podcast. And then as a tech podcast, my CPM is five times to eight times more, sometimes 10 times more because podcast has more ads. Um, if I do a tech podcast, I can make eight to 10 X the money my gaming channel would make. So now I do a tech podcast and I do it maybe as a live stream podcast to make it easier to produce and not take as much time away from the gaming channel. And I just cut out Netflix or something, or I cut out my gaming time when I'm not streaming. And so then I, I, I do that. And so then with a, with that podcast, I also have more access to collaborations now too, because with a tech podcast, I'd have more collaboration capabilities. So if I'm a gamer, I start a tech podcast as a second channel. Now I have more monetization. Now I have different sponsors. Now some of my sponsors overlap and I can double dip and I can sell double sponsorship. And now I'm not pissing off the gaming audience and having them call me a sellout and a shill because I want to make money and I don't want to be broke and be a broke influencer. Don't be a broke influencer. Don't listen to the people in your audience who call you a sellout. So I treat it like a business. I start the second brand and then I grow that and there is some overlap. I'm able to grow it organically. I'm able to get some support. You can monetize a podcast channel easier. I, I monetized my podcast channel in 30 days because I had to reset because I passed the threshold because I took a massive break during the pandemic. So I had to start over. I had the subscribers, but I didn't have the watch time. So I got the watch time in 30 days on the podcast because what I do, I streamed five days a week. Roberto's answer is always probably going to be more content. As long as the quality is good enough and the audience says yes, once your audience says yes, and they're not demanding higher quality, you should probably just give them more of what they said yes to. A lot of you get suckered in by YouTubers saying quality over quantity. They're getting paid brand deals. That's why they'll do higher quality content that gets more views because they're worried about the brand deals. That's part of it. The other thing is they want the portfolio and they want the clout and they want the standard. And there's nothing wrong. I'm not throwing shade. I'm saying that what works for big YouTubers doesn't always work for small YouTubers. And so when big YouTubers say quality over quantity, they're playing a reputation game. Y'all are trying to leave your day job. That's the difference. The difference is they're there for their reputation. They already have the bag. Their house is already paid off. That's the difference. Parsing that advice matters. Parsing that advice matters. That's why a mid-tier YouTuber that's making six figures might have much more practical advice than a YouTuber that's making eight figures because it's closer to where you're at as to be attainable at that point. 
You get what I'm saying? But people only want advice from people who live an unattainable lifestyle and they don't listen to people who have something that may be fantastic compared to where they're at, but is at least within striking distance or is something that you could aspire to instead of just dream about being a 10 million subscribe YouTube channel, being Mr. Beast, being PewDiePie, being Markiplier, being Jacksepticeye. That's a dream and a fantasy, but making six figures is not. Because 20% of Amer America's top 20% of earners are the people making $100,000 a year. It's the top 20% of Americans. If one in five working adults can do it, it's not fa a fantasy. If one in five working adults in America, aka the top 20% of uh, earners in America, starts at uh, $100,000 a year. Now the top 10%. That gap is $155,000 a year now. The top 1% is $460,000 a year now. So that's the that's what we're playing with. So making $100,000 a year in America is not far-fetched when one out of five of the people working in the economy can do it. Being a homeowner isn't a fantasy and a pipe dream when 63% of American adults are homeowners. But they go, oh, you're never going to be a homeowner. I used to believe that too. The data doesn't support that. So the thing is, being a middle-class creator and being able to earn 55, 65, 75, $100,000 a year is not that far-fetched. It's hard work. Not everyone does it. There's a high failure rate, but there's a high failure rate because a lot of people are young. The biggest problem with the high failure rate of YouTube is how young people are. They have no experience, no technical ability, no resources. All they have is time and passion. But if you're an adult and you're in your 30s, you have a better, higher probability as an adult in your 30s of succeeding at YouTube because you have life experience, you take money seriously, you're going to treat it like a business, not a hobby in theory at least, and you're going to take it seriously and you have a really good motivator, which is called leaving the 9 to 5 job. So there's that aspect of it. You are as an adult, you have a higher level of discipline. You don't have the free time and stamina and energy as a 20-something-year-old. But as a 30-something-year-old adult or a 40-something-year-old adult, you have lived experience, discipline, and you respect money. So you might be able to make more money as a YouTuber. You might not get the views that a young person gets, but you might be able to say, I'll go into a profitable niche instead of my number one passion. I'll pick my number five passion because it pays better. That's smart. And it's more sustainable for me. And it fits with my lifestyle. So the thing is, adult YouTubers have to do YouTube in a way and a manner that fits with their lifestyle, balances health, family responsibility, and bills and commitments. And that's a different path. I understood that path because I was a freelancer first. And that's a really good way to transition into being a full-time creator is to go the freelancing route because then you have cash flow in your favor. When you cash flow and you're like me, and you have your, like with me, I had uh, three or four publications I was writing for, getting like uh, $250 an article. So I knew I was going to make like, you know, $1,000 to $1,500 writing articles. My rent in North Carolina was $960. So I knew I could pay bills and utilities off the writing. I was making $1,200 from Amazon, $500 on AdSense. I knew that I was going to have money left over after I pay rent and utilities and that we weren't going to starve and that I could pay my car note. And eventually I paid my car off and that took that off the table. So that was great. So I had, uh, I was able to start paying down the little bit of debt there was for my credit card debt. There was massive family medical debt that I paid later. Okay. So that made a difference. So managing finance, financial literacy, discipline, adults have that in their favor. Young people do not. Young people at best have in their favor, a lack of responsibility, an abundance of energy and an abundance of time. So you have different trade-off skills there and not enough people talk about it. That's why the YouTubers who relate to me the least are the 20-something-year-olds and the teenagers. That's why they're not the biggest part of this community. In my analytics, the biggest part of this community is people over 25 through ages 55. Overwhelmingly, 80% of you are over 25. People under 25 with very few exceptions do not relate to me. And that's fine. I'm almost 40. Why would they? They'll grow up They'll age up, they'll sell out, they'll grow up and sell out, and then they'll relate to me because everyone gets old if they're fortunate. So there's 20-something-year-olds will wake up one day, be 35-year-olds, and say, Roberto was right. That's how it is. Because it's the same thing with their parents. They complain and they give their parents a hard time, and then they wake up one day, and then they're older than their parents were when they were griefing their parents, and they go, oh, you know what? Mom was right. Dad was right. Grandpa was right. Auntie was right. 
everyone grows up and ends up facing that mirror. That's how it is. So long story short, a lot of creators that are younger do not relate to the advice that's not just validating what they're passionate about. People in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, I've seen more of those creators succeed. The largest failure rate for YouTube lies with people under 30, not over 30. The success rate on YouTube favors age. Now, virality and being a mega YouTuber favors being young and single with no kids. Almost everybody with 10 million, with Casey Neistat and Matt Pat being major exceptions, major exceptions, most YouTubers get that 10 million if they're able to get to 1 million when they're young, single, and have no kids. They, if they get to 1 million when they're young and single and have no kids and they go and they can do that, then it's easier for those people to get to 10 million because they don't have responsibility in that same way. So that's young YouTubers populate the tippy tippy top in that regard. However, the creator middle class is populated by YouTubers that are in their late 20s, in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. That's the YouTube middle class if you analyze the data. If you analyze what we do know, and I look at all of the creator economy reports. I looked at the one that YouTube and Oxford Economics put out. I look at the one that ConvertKit put out. I look at all these companies' creator economy reports, and all the data has been consistent so far to reflect that more of the full-time content creators that earn fifty-five to over $100,000 a year tend to be in their 30s or older. Tend to be in their 30s or older. It does skew a little bit more male in that regard for many different reasons, largely, I think, due to the family component and the family responsibility component. So that does play a role. That Those things play a role. And if you notice, it also similarly parallels to uh, Silicon Valley. I would say the creator economy somewhat, somewhat mirrors Silicon Valley in that regard. So a lot of people don't know about, maybe I'll do a video one day about like creator economy statistics, or maybe that'll be a live stream or a podcast, honestly. Uh, Afote uh, says, I would love to see an interview with uh, people hands-on experience creating these algorithms. Uh, I'm going to try. There's somebody at YouTube I have in mind for that, Todd Beaupre. I'm going to see if I can get him. If I can get Todd Beaupre, he is the algorithm guy. He's the algorithm guy. Um, so if I can interview, if I can interview Todd Beaupre, who I know is a fan of the channel, friend of the show, that's a hard interview to get, though. Uh, he's a very busy man, but he always helps creators. He actually came and did a lunch with some of the Atlanta creators here. I was there. FD Signifier was there. Some other people were there. Um, it was like eight of us. And Todd and YouTube, uh, like you put it on the credit card, like you know, he paid for lunch. Uh, it was very informal. It was very fun. Um, he's a good guy. I've always enjoyed my conversations with him. He's very smart. I would love to interview him. It's very difficult um, to get um, a lot of these people and get these interviews. Uh, thanks, Cricket, for saying I'm good at it. I appreciate it. Um. Oh, so important. You remember the old days on AOL when like, yeah. Oh, you're on the computer too long. You're tying up the phone line. Um, you're thinking of doing a channel about pit bulls. I think that would do very well. I think YouTube shorts of pit bulls and dogs in general would go viral. Yes. I remember Netscape Navigator, Netscape, the old heads, all the old heads, hashtag old heads, all the hashtag old heads remember Netscape Navigator. Oh God. I remember playing StarCraft on the computer and getting knocked off with the phone line. Remember StarCraft? Uh, you can invite lead attorney. I would love to do an interview with lead attorney in person. I could actually bring the good cameras for that. Dude, th if, like, if the lead attorney wants to do something, I'll bring all three camera angles. I'll bring all three camera angles, bring all the mics, do everything.
Katie, ukulele says, Roberto, I'm loving your content and information. Thanks. Set aside about 25% of your gross earnings for income tax time. Facts. Facts. Talk to your accountant and CPA, but yep, basically. Basically. Oh, yeah, we do have some Robin Hoods. They're called CPAs. I like that. That's a good joke, but it's facts. I like that. Yeah, 25 to 30% for taxes is typically what you want to set aside uh, just in case. Uh, it could end up effectively being less if you have good CPAs. If you have good CPAs, it ends up being less, but that's what you should set aside in your head just you know to deal with it. Um, can you pay taxes throughout the year so it won't be as high? Yes, Edwin, yes. And that's a good idea to do. I talk about that in my video. Yes, Zara, exactly. Robin Hood took money back from the government, back from the government who wrongfully seized it, and he didn't steal from the rich. Robin Hood took the money back from the sheriff of Nottingham who was basically, you know, he was law enforcement on behalf of Prince John, who was the government. Prince John wasn't just some rich dude. He was the government. So, yeah. Slandered Gamer, thank you for joining uh, the membership. Appreciate you. Make sure you're getting all the members exclusive content in the members only part of the community tab. Sewing Report says, I know a fairly large YouTuber who paid an accountant and she didn't pay his quarterly taxes, so he was on the hook for his mistake. See, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I go through my CPAs and accountants, but I pay the IRS directly because I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm not going to let that happen to me. So I pay the IRS directly because I actually had a bad CPA once and it was not a good it was not a good time. It was not a good time. I ended up with back taxes because of so I pay myself the I pay the IRS myself. I directly go to irs.gov and I pay that thing myself. I let my uh, CPA tell me what the number is and I pay it. And I just pay it. I just like I give the government its pound of flesh and I look the other way. It's fine. It's I, I would rather just pay it myself and know that I did it. I print off Every time I pay my taxes, I print off the confirmation and I print off the whole thing so that I have a physical record of it. Um, I do not play around with this. I do not play around with this. Um, so it's a real thing. Oh, you got blacklisted from PayPal? Wow, that's crazy. That's crazy. I do paid channel reviews. Um, we haven't done channel reviews in the super chat thing for a hot minute. Um, at some point, I'll bring them back. We're just not really focused on that right now. But I do paid channel reviews. I think info is in the description on that. Oh, Mommy Visions, you're Panamanian too from your mother and your mother's from Cologne. Oh, respect. Appreciate you. Um, no, I'm not retiring in the UK. The tax situation over there is not great. And there's other things with the UK. No offense to anyone in the UK. You guys have a lovely country in some respects, but um, there's a lot over there that I'm not a fan of. And I don't think the tax situation would be great for me. I want to retire. Like, And the thing is, retire loosely is a word. I'll probably work forever. And by that, I mean I'll write more books. I'll write books forever like John Maxwell does. I'll, I'll just write books forever. Like That's my plan. My plan is to write books forever. Uh, so I'll always be a creator. I plan to write books. Uh, at some point, I want to buy, uh, like I want to do a documentary film at some point about the creator economy. I want to do documentaries. I want to do documentaries. I want to do interviews. Um I really like what Chris Doe is doing. I want to do stuff like that. I want to do seminars. I want to do my own conference. Um, Daryl Eves has inspired me. I want to do a conference. I want to focus on the monetization side of the creator economy if I do a conference. If I want to do a conference, I don't want to be a YouTube growth content conference. And I don't want it to be a, uh, something that's fan driven. I don't want it to be, oh, I'm coming here to see big YouTubers. I literally want content creators who want to monetize. And I want to focus on that for Awesome Creator Summit when it comes. When I do Awesome Creator Summit, I will probably do it in here in, I'll either do it here in Georgia or I'll do it in Texas. 
I will either do it here in Georgia or I'll do it in Texas. One, it's easier to fly out to those places. It's not as expensive for your hotels. The food and cost around those things are not expensive. And we do need East Coast conferences now. We need to take some of this stuff out of California because it's too expensive and too hard for people to get to California. So I feel like if I bring a conference for creators to Georgia or Texas, and then it's not California or New York, I think that that makes a difference. So it'll be likely Florida can be nice, but sometimes travel to Florida can be expensive because of all the attractions in Florida. So I feel like either here in Georgia or in Texas is the cheapest travel and hotel arrangement for working class creators to be able to get to. So that's how I would do my event. And I'll invite YouTubers who can speak, but I'm probably going to invite mostly YouTubers that the biggest YouTubers I would invite probably would have one or 2 million. Um, I have nothing against people who have 10 million, but I think it becomes spectacle at that point. I think people show up to be fan fanboys and fangirls at that point. Uh, I would want people to be able to teach and stuff like that. So I'd want to invite a lot of my friends who are educators and not just YouTube educators. I'd want to invite people that can teach video and audio workshops to help people improve their content. I would want to do a lot of stuff focused around monetization and making money building business. I'd want lawyers and I'd want CPAs teaching at the conference, <clears throat> helping people with these problems, speaking to them directly. So like that's the kind of conference I would want to run. I would, I would want to do that. And that's my plan in the next two to three years is to actually uh, start the beginnings of that conference. Something now that we're winding out of the pandemic, something in 2023 that I'm going to do, and you'll get to see content from it on the channel because I talked about how much I admire Christo and Patrick Bet David. Something I'm going to do, like Chris Doe does, is I'm going to do workshops. I'm going to rent out a conference uh, space. I'm going to rent out a conference room at a, a, a hotel that has security, rent out a conference room, <clears throat> charge and we'll do this probably like every other month charge to do an all day workshop for creators here in Atlanta, Georgia. And we'll film the whole thing. We'll film the whole thing. I'll task a crew. This is why it's going to take me a minute because I got to get employees on board or at least contractors. that are competent, get some friends in the local area to help. I'm going to task a crew and then I'll do a workshop and I'll do panels where I have some of the local Atlanta YouTubers on panels in person, in person, and we'll film the whole thing. We'll film the whole thing. We'll cut up the clips from those workshops, put them on my channel, and then I'll be doing content that is training and workshops for creators with a live audience that attended. And we'll be posting the clips from that to the YouTube channel. And so, and the Q and A's and things like that, because I love what the future does with their live workshops. So we'll do that here and it'll just not just be me. It'll be me and it'll be other Atlanta creators collaborating on this. So that'll be my collabs and we'll film these. And this will be like every other month starting next year, um, every month or every other month. I'd like to do it every month, honestly, if I can make it, if I can make that work. And so like, uh, and I'll set these things up and then it'll be great. Because we'll, um, you know, we'll be supporting local area because people have to get lunch. So like they'll end up going to lunch at some local shop. So Main Street dollars. We're supporting the hospitality industry that's needing to recover from the pandemic. I'll have local hires to help me with the filming and editing and shooting and everything. We'll have local hires and it'll be great. And it'll be great for the local area. It'll be great for the Atlanta creator community, you know, and It'll help even some small business owners transition onto social media and they'll be great. And then you guys will get another level of content. That's more about the production than the editing and more about the value of the video than the editing. And I think that that'll be really good content to make. And so that's the evolution. The evolution will be things like that. The evolution will be more interviews. Um, I have several in person interviews that I'm editing um, we have a success story from the community that I'm editing. So I, I interviewed a beauty YouTuber that grew it during the pandemic. And in six months, she went from 20,000 to 100,000 subscribers. She's now over 100,000 subscribers, six months. Um, 
another creator that went from zero to over a hundred thousand in a year, two years, two years, I think two years and built a six figure business into a seven big figure business in two years as an artist. So I have an actual artist. I have a woman, Sarah Renee Clark, who did her art. She's from Australia. Yeah. So shout out to the Aussies. Like, uh, I have a creator from Australia, Sarah Renee Clark. I have an interview coming out in two weeks. She grew from zero to 100,000 during the pandemic, I think in two years, and grew from a six-figure business as an artist to a seven-figure business as an artist. So artists can make it on YouTube and you can do art on YouTube. You just have to be smart about your art. You have to be smart about your art. People are like, oh, I want to make art and everything like that. Well, you don't have to be a starving artist. You don't have to be broke. There's no novel. There's no nobility in being broke. There's nothing noble about being broke. It's irresponsible. So like it's irresponsible when you have a choice. When your choices are taken away from you, that's a very different subject. That's a very different thing because those people that had choices taken from them or don't have agency, that's something different. When you're choosing to not monetize properly because of your ego as an artist, that's something else entirely. Artists have to kill their ego or they starve. If you feed your ego, you will starve as an artist. That's a Roberto Blake quote. If you feed your ego, you will starve as an artist. So Sarah Renee Clark and I had a lovely conversation while we were at Vid Summit. I recorded the whole thing. So once the editing is finished on that, we got two camera angles for it. Once the editing is done on that, that comes out in maybe two weeks. Still processing the audio, I think. Uh, it was the main thing that took time. And so I think that'll be really good, very strong, and it'll help a lot of people. Uh, the beauty influencer, Glab Girl Gabby, Gabby Glam Girl Gabby, uh, again, from 20,000 to 100,000 in six months. She beat my record. I went from 20,000 to 100,000 in like 14 months. She beat my record. She did it twice as fast. Very smart creator, uh, very smart approach to it. That interview is almost done. I think that interview probably will drop next Thursday or Friday, this coming Thursday or Friday, rather. So this Thursday or Friday. So I've got two interviews dropping in October, maybe three. No, actually three, because I have an interview um, that the members only people you've already saw the preview of this interview. You saw the unedited version. So members get exclusive content. Members saw the unedited version of my interview with Max the Meat Guy, who grew from zero to three million in two years and how he did it. And we talked about brand deals. We talked about TikTok, Instagram Reels, and YouTube competing as far as shorts. Uh, we talked about all of it because he's a multi-platform creator. Zero to three million in two years. He's another pandemic success story. So the thing is, I'm covering a lot of YouTubers who got to 100,000, 50,000, a million during the pandemic and proving with them within their own words that YouTubers still are succeeding and growing on this platform and that a lot of this is just not doing the work, making excuses, or not recognizing how to work within your limitations. Because they're actually real about some of the limitations they had when they started as small YouTubers. And I think it's a very sober look at how this works and that these people were not lucky. These people took advantage of the opportunities they had with the time freedom the pandemic created. And that made a difference. And that's why so many creators did grow during the pandemic. That was why the creator economy became a buzzword during the pandemic is because people finally had the time. They finally had the time to actually go hard at this. I had the time to go hard at this because I was already a freelancer. Yeah, Panama looks lovely. Yeah, like I said, I might retire there. I might just go back to my family's ancestral home and retire there. Um, I'll buy. I'll build a new property because um, my sister probably will get uh, my dad's property. Um, on my mother's side with our great grandparents, um, unfortunately, we had a land theft issue. We lost that, so it's not in the family anymore. If I can't get that stuff back, then I'll have to start over, which is fine. I'm fine to start over because I always plan to go back there, buy some land, and build something anyway. But I really wish that if I can, I'll try and take back the land that we originally had. But, you know, like some of y'all, as immigrants, you understand that sometimes you lose your family's holdings or you lose your family's land and legacy. These things happen. Um, 
But me, my goal in life, one of my many goals in life is to try to take it back. Um, that's one of the things I'm working toward. In addition to starting a family, that's one of the things I'm working toward. So the book is Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from Their Passion in the Creator Economy. Um, Alan asked, when, what is the next book? Um, so the, what's the next book? Oh, wait, what's next on your book? Oh, there's a lot of things in the book. There's a lot of things about the audio book will come out before the end of the year. If I have anything to say about it, the audio book will come out before the end of the year. Um, I want to read a section out of my book for you. I actually want to read something from the book for, for all of you. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of light reading here of the, of the book for you. This maybe ends up being a preview of the audiobook in a way, in a way. So this is something I want to read from, let's read from, let's, what page do I want to read from? I don't think I'll read a whole chapter, but I'm going to, I'm going to read something to you. Actually, I might read a lot of this to you. like, all right, I want to read chapter. I want to read a section from chapter eight. We'll read a section from chapter eight. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to throw on some of my own lo-fi music. Um, I think this sounds good. This, all right, so that's good. All right, I'm going to read. I'm going to read to y'all. Roberto's reading time. I'm going to read to y'all for a little bit, just a few minutes. Let's turn down the background music just a little bit. It's impossible to get noticed as a beginner. Everything's too saturated. You don't understand because you already have a following. That's what I hear from people. There are common uh, these are common outcries I hear every day and have been hearing since 2016 after crossing 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. And every year I've watched creators who started from nothing succeed only to have their years of quietly working with their heads down be reduced to people saying Quote, they just got lucky, unquote. When you're first starting out, it should be absolutely hard to get attention. I'm not saying that as some elitist. I'm saying that as the person in the audience. But yes, there is currently an abundance of options and nearly unlimited choices in consuming content, and it will only become more competitive. That's good for the audience, not bad for a creator. Put the audience first, think about it from their perspective, and ask yourself what you are willing to do in order to earn that attention that you want. Nobody is entitled to an audience. And this is from chapter three, sorry, chapter eight, page 83. Moving to page 84. It's a very harsh but important lesson to learn. When you realize that you and your work doesn't deserve attention just for existing, it can sober you up and make you a bit more humble about the prospect of asking for people's time and energy. Why are you more deserving of this limited five to 10 minutes of attention, the time that they will never get back versus anything they could be doing or spending their time on? You're not competing with every other creator. You are competing with every other priority in their life. You are fighting with their kid or significant other or their deadlines for their attention, and you don't even realize it. It's your responsibility to make your content something that can be a priority in their lives. This should be the last thing that discourages someone as a new content creator. It should give you a much clearer path to understanding you need to make your content valuable to your audience and respect their time and step their time and step up and fight for their attention. You have probably rewarded creators who have taken that approach and you have probably ignored or abandoned the ones who didn't. When I had the pleasure of interviewing one of my favorite content creators, Marquez Brownlee, who you probably know as MKBHD, he gave me the best piece of advice for aspiring creators. Quote, 
I became the creator that I would want to watch. End quote. This sounds incredibly simple. You should understand, while this, while this sounds incredibly simple, you should understand that when he got started, Marquez made 100 videos and only got about 70 subscribers. I'm going to repeat that. When he got started, Marquez made 100 videos and only got about 70 subscribers from it. 100 videos and 70 subscribers. Over 10 years and 1,000 videos later, Marquez would find himself with over 12 million subscribers and being the biggest name in tech and consumer electronics on the internet, if not the world. Judging Marquez's career trajectory, uh, judging Marquez's career trajectory and potential by even the first 30% of his career would have been a mistake. Instead, he started with what he had and looked to improve with each execution. He also committed to giving his audience the best video quality he was capable of, even early on when he didn't have much. Looking back at his fifth update video from December of 2009, he made that commitment directly to his audience just one year into his YouTube journey. After three years of continuous posting, he earned 100,000 subscribers on the platform in 2012, and in 2014, he earned 1 million subscribers on YouTube. On a surface level, this would look to someone like overnight success, but it actually resulted from making hundreds of videos and incrementally improving with every execution. It was also the result of the same discipline that produces a champion athlete. For those of you who don't know, when Marquez is not making tech content or episodes of his podcast, he is a pro-level ultimate Frisbee player and has, be, and has been competitive in the sport since high school. I've often in interviews said, treat being a content creator like playing a sport. And I sincerely mean that. The marathon versus the sprint analogy is very close to my heart as a former cross country and track runner. So what does treating this as a sport look like? Well, for one thing, you give yourself a bit more grace. There's very little point as a rookie in comparing yourself to the greatest athlete in a sport, even or even a seasoned player. There is no reason a rookie would be able to put points on the board, and there is not much point in expecting a cheering section after your third day of practice. When it comes to being a content creator, people have the aspirations of going pro and doing it for a living, but don't dedicate even a few months of consistency to learning their craft and the rules of the game. Meanwhile, if they pursue a career in sports, they know it can take years of hard work, focused training at the expense of their social life and other hobbies just to get slightly better. And this is when you don't have natural talent and ability. If you don't have those gifts, you sacrifice everything to outwork and outperform the people that do. And this is on page 86 here. Make no mistake, the marathon alone weeds people out who aren't able to make those kinds of commitments for one reason or another. It seems unfair or exclusionary, or that those who made it are incredibly privileged until you remember just one thing. The audience deserves nothing but the best. Remember that. If it seems unfair, the audience deserves nothing but the best. You can only be rewarded as a content creator by creating value for the audience, regardless of how you feel about the outcome. It's almost disrespectful to call it unfair. That they didn't give you their attention and support. It's their time and energy you're asking for. They have every right to be choosy or particular about who they invest in. You would be too. My good friend Brian Fanzo is someone I came up with on social media, and he always said this, quote, unquote, think like a fan. And that has always stuck with me. It's why I encourage every content creator to put their audience first. When we put our audience first, we make an effort to pay attention to how they respond to everything, but also to anticipate their needs and concerns. And when I make content, I'm creating content for a particular type of viewer. Not everyone, but for who I believe to be an overlooked, 
an underserved audience. I believe that depth and focus are lacking in the content I consume because ultimately most of the platforms today are driven by large numbers and they prioritize entertainment-based content and entertainment-based creators. In order to grow, even in order to grow, even those who do education have had to take an entertaining approach to the audience. And they have to do that is as much, if not more so, and make it a priority when fighting for attention. While this is a winning formula for creators when it comes to the largest population of viewers, it does leave behind a group of people who crave depth and don't want to be distracted by over-the-top stunts or memes in the middle of trying to learn something. The viewer numbers around short-form content also mean that more creators are pursuing this and abandoning long-form content because they see higher viewer engagement and therefore greater rewards and greater validation in exchange for sometimes less effort. And while this makes sense, the subject matter and makes the subject matter more interesting to a larger group of typically younger viewers, it does come at the expense of people who would truly want to put what they are learning into practice rather than to satisfy curiosity. My approach to stepping up your content and truly standing out from the crowd is threefold but is also highly ambitious. Most content creators can only focus on one or two aspects of this at a time, but my ultimate goal and what I've been seeing work for several creators is to execute on all three of these at the highest level they're capable of. And here are what those three things are. This is on page 88. Value, what attracts or interests the audience is value. Quality, the experience the audience has when consuming content. And quantity, a consistent and evergreen focus on high value, high quality content. And so that is a portion of chapter eight. And uh, what I wrote in my book, Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from the Passion in the Creator Economy. And that's part of what you can look for forward to in the audiobook. That's part of what the audiobook will sound like when it's coming for me when I'm doing the narration. Uh, minus uh, background music. Minus the background music. So that's what you can uh, basically expect. Um, Noah was taken. Thank you for becoming a channel member. Uh, you're appreciated. Appreciate you. So yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's a little bit of a reading of the book. Uh, Noah, uh, you should be getting one of those tweets, so uh, make sure you look for it. Um, Pokey Lee says, do you think shorts is the future or a valid moneymaker? YouTube is putting ad revenue behind it in 2023. So I believe that YouTube believes that shorts are the future of the platform from an onboarding standpoint and from a legacy recruitment standpoint of attracting the youngest, newest crop of content creators. So I believe that YouTube believes shorts is the future when it comes to onboarding new creators that shorts is the gateway. So shorts is the gateway now. And it's an onboarding mechanism for new and young creators and then they are going to support that with the money side, with the ad revenue. It will not make the same ad revenue as regular content proportionately, though. It will be it will make lower, but kids and new creators will be so happy to get something that that won't matter right away. So from that standpoint, but for those of us who are adults, it matters in the fact that then we won't shy away from shorts because we know we'll get paid for them. We know that we have some guarantee of payment from them. They're also adding super thanks, which are very similar to the super chats to shorts natively. And they've done a really good job of how it is there so that the creator doesn't have to ask for the donation. So it's really strong. And I think that alone is going to hurt TikTok and Twitch. And with the YouTube fan funding requirements getting ready to be very low and being a step below the YouTube partner program that creators get to make money from YouTube with, that's going to be game changing and get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of creators monetized on YouTube again, but it'll be fan funding, but that then makes it competitive with Twitch. 
And in 2023, 2024, I anticipate YouTube massively updating their live stream platform to be much more competitive with Twitch. YouTube is going to bury Twitch as if Twitch isn't disintegrating on its own. So in that sense, I believe that shorts and live streaming are going to become somewhat on par with regular videos, but regular videos will be the core of YouTube because there will always be an audience for those things. The shorts audience will be less attached and will be more fickle. We've seen that with TikTok and then people not showing up for them at VidCon, right? With TikTok creators having no one show up for them at VidCon. So the thing is, I think there are vulnerabilities to short form in building a deep connection with your audience. I don't think it's impossible, but y'all be honest. Y'all don't really remember a lot of the shorts creators and TikTokers that you've watched. You remember the videos. So it's like back in the day when YouTubers were known for their viral videos. So it's like old YouTube in that way. People didn't know Taze on Day. They knew Chocolate Rain. You get what I'm saying? Like people don't know the actual creator. They know Charlie bit my finger. You see what I'm saying? That's how those viral meme type videos are. Is you don't know the creator, you know the videos. That's how it was. So I think shorts will be a moneymaker, but they won't compare to regular videos and they won't compare to live streams. With live streams on my podcast channel, and yes, you can call me an anomaly because I'm at least a known person, but on my live streams, I make really good money on the podcast channel, which is almost all live streams. But the CPM on that channel is also an over $20 CPM and it can be higher too. So if I do the podcast more, I make good money. I can make money on the podcast channel that starts to rival the regular channel. If I get the podcast channel to if I get the podcast channel to 10,000 views per upload and like 10, 20,000 subscribers, actually not even 10,000. If I get the if I start doing the podcast regularly again. If I start doing the podcast regularly again. And I get even 100,000 views on the podcast per month and I get 10,000 subscribers on the podcast. I can start getting sponsors very easily for that podcast. If the audio downloads are somewhat on par with that and the podcast channel already gets a thousand to 2000 views for every episode anyway, even though it only has 2000 subscribers. If the podcast gets to 10,000 subscribers and is doing two to 5,000 views every episode. And if the podcast channel's evergreen content starts getting play and the podcast channel ever gets to a hundred thousand views a month, the podcast channel will make two to 3,000 a month, not counting sponsor content. The podcast channel with 10,000 subscribers will rival the main channel that has 500,000 because podcasting is that lucrative because I'll get double dip on sponsors for the video and the audio side because the audio downloads are worth more to sponsors. And that's not counting. If I get the email list currently from 13,000 to 25,000, I will make 3,000, I'll make 2,000 to 3,000 per sponsored post for my email list as well. So I can make my email list and my podcast each just body the ad revenue that I make from the main channel fairly easily with much smaller numbers. That tells you something. Meanwhile, TikTok, Reels, and YouTube Shorts can't even begin to compete with regular ad revenue. So I think everyone is obsessed with short form as a distraction because it validates people with views, but the money is not there, my friends. The money is in live streaming, long form, and podcasting, and it's not even close, and the money's in the list. The money is in long form, live streaming, and list. Nobody's talking about this. You will make, if you have like, if you had an email list of 30 to 50,000 people in a dedicated niche, you will make 5,000 to 6,000 per sponsored email. As long as you have a 20% open rate, you will make with, with having 25 to 50,000 email subscribers, you will make 5,000 to $6,000 per sponsored email. I'm not joking. I am not playing. It's that serious. It is that serious. So, I mean, with my current list, for a list, a tweet, and a community tab post, I got $2,000 plus on a sponsor once with my email list. And my email list is over 10000
it's not 20,000, but it's like I can get a thousand, 2,000 on posting and saying, okay, I'll give you an email sponsor plug with a, an advertorial paragraph and a banner ad for like two grand, 2,500. And I'll give you a tweet and a community tab post. Boom. A couple grand on a 10,000 plus email list. That's serious. So there's money in the list. Live streams, as all of you know, you can get hundreds or thousands in donations if you're good at it. Plus you get to monetize the replays. Then you also get to have memberships. Plus you also get to do the clips and you can monetize the clips. So you have all that and you can still make shorts out of it. So long form wins for all of those reasons because you can repurpose it to all the other content formats. Long form helps build a list. Podcasting double dips. If it's a video live stream podcast, if it's a video live stream podcast, you get, you get to double dip because you get audio sponsors and video sponsors. Audio sponsors care about your download numbers for the audio side and your listener numbers, not your YouTube view numbers. That's a bonus. So now you get to double dip on that. You can have multiple sponsors in a single video during a live stream podcast and people will not complain. Plus you get the ad revenue on it. Plus you get the YouTube premium revenue. Plus you get the super chats, super stickers, super thanks. It's un it's unbeatable. It's unbeatable. But everyone's ignoring podcasting, live streaming, long form content and list to chase shorts and TikTok and reels because everyone's chasing viral vertical video now and it's a fine add on and it gets your reach and attention. But if you got to pay bills, if you have to pay bills, three L's become a W because list long form and live streaming Three L's make a W. <laughs> Those are three L's that make a W because that is where the money is and it's not even close. And it's not even close. So, you know, more real talk from Roberto. More real talk. This old Japanese steakhouse, thank you for the super chat. Bought the book, can't wait to read it. Creators should get trademarks for their channel. Oh, this is a great question. I want to bring on the lawyers for this. Trademarks for your channel can be good. Uh, the LLC is good because you get the uh, insurance. Again, not legal advice. Uh, you get you get liability insurance for the channel as an LLC or an S Corp. So that's really good. Helps with errors and omissions. If you take brand deals, you need the LLC protections and you need the liability insurance if you take brand deals. So that becomes really important. Um, the trademarks can help you with violations of your copyright. The trademarks could also possibly help you get verified on Instagram. If you if you have a trademark, it's actually easier to get val verified on Instagram if you can submit that you have a trademark. So if you can submit that you have a trademark, it's easier to get verified on Instagram. A lot of people don't realize that. Let's see. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up here. I have to eat dinner and I have to feed the pets. Wow. I, I'm i so far behind on the chat. My bad, everybody. Yep. Yeah, if you want to go daily, you either need really easy to produce content or additional help. Facts. Facts. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Who would I love to interview one day? Uh, I'd love to interview Chris Doe. I need to do another interview with Pat Flynn. I would love to interview uh, Mr. Beast, obviously. I'd love to interview Colin and Samir. I want to interview MKBHD again. I want to interview KSI. Um, I want to interview Hayden Hiller-Smith. I have plans to interview Matthew Beam. Uh, I've talked to Zealous. I want to interview him, especially uh, him. Um, 
I want to interview some people from Mr. B's team. I want to interview Michelle Carr. I want to interview Shelby Church. Uh, I want to have another chat with Sarah Dietschy. I want to interview Graham Stephan. Um, and I'd love to interview I, Justine and Jenna. And who else would I want to interview? Obviously, I want to interview more people uh, from YouTube. I want to interview my friend um, John Yusei. I want to interview... I'd love to interview Patrick Bet David, honestly. I want to interview Chris Doe. Green screens can be good to use if you know what you're doing. I do have a green screen tutorial planned. Hopefully that green screen tutorial comes out next Thursday. We will see if that happens. Maybe tutorial Thursday comes back, believe it or not. So, yeah. This old Japanese house, your name is solid. Yeah, and I would trademark that. I would try to trademark that, honestly. Yes, I try to do a mix of different levels of production uh, to make the uh, consistency feel more stable as well. Yeah. You're looking forward to my quest? Yeah, next year we start the path to the gold play button next year. Disco Posse Podcast. Thank you for becoming a channel member. Appreciate you. I think we're close to having 100 channel members. Once we have 100 channel members, the next goal is 500 channel members. And then we'll get 1,000 channel members and we will fulfill the quest of 1,000 true fans. So I have, I'm actually going to make a quest log. I have several quests on YouTube. So right now the quest is... Whenever we do it, you know, get to 600K because that's the next milestone. Next milestone is 600K. I don't think we get before the end of the year, but it would be nice. So if you guys can go out and recruit, that's nice. So 600K by the end of the year, 500 channel members whenever we get it, then 1,000 um, That because we're at about 100 channel members. I really love that. We're posting five exclusive videos a month, five for five, five exclusive member, five exclusive members, only videos a month. And I'm doing a decent job of keeping up with some of that. We have over a hundred exclusive pieces of content for the channel members to view currently. So that's great. You guys get some of my interviews weeks in advance. So that's awesome for y'all. And you get more than just the interviews. You get all kinds of little exclusives. Um, so it's, um, it's pretty dope to be a channel member because of the exclusives that you get. So five exclusive videos for channel members only, five of them a month, five for five. That's the deal. So if you want to be a channel member, please consider signing up. Um, so we're doing that. Yeah, we do polls on the community tab. And so uh, I think that that's going to be great. We're at about roughly 100 channel members. I'm really excited about that. So that's dope. Uh, we were almost to a thousand book sales total, not for this stream. I wish it was for this stream, but total we're almost to a thousand book sales. So I really appreciate y'all. And we've only had the book out for a month and a half. The print book has only been out three weeks. So that's tremendous. We've done hundreds of sales of the print book. I think we're almost to 300 sales for the print book. So that's dope. Really appreciate y'all. I can probably check what those numbers look like. Oh, yeah. Between the hand copies I've sold, we've sold 260 plus copies of the print book. And I've sold by hand over 50 at the last two conferences. So we've sold like 300 of the print book in like three weeks. So that's a crazy number. That's really exciting. That means we've sold almost 800 books in a month and a half. So that's dope. So that's really dope. So report says, yes, I'm a middle-class YouTuber and we get overlooked by huge channels. Facts. But I also think a lot of channels blow up fast that are big. The big channels blow up fast at some point. Now, not all of them, but some of them, they grew up so fast, especially now with shorts, that a lot of them, they don't take the journey of staying a middle-class creator very long. And so um, it's easy to forget or not know or not relate. Slow-growing channels do make up the middle class, though. Uncle Stu, thank you for the super chat $10. Salute, salute, supporting the stream. Thank you very much. We're about to wrap up. I don't want to lose my voice. I've got to feed the pets. I got to feed myself. Just trying to catch up on some of the chat here. 
the Disco Posse podcast. Thank you for the $10 super chat. You're always appreciated. Thank you, Sewing Report, for another $10 super chat. Appreciate you for sharing your weekend with us. Thank you. That's dope. Roberto, have you ever had a lack of enthusiasm, energy, and desire? Has you overcome it? It was the pandemic for me. For me, what you're describing, that was the pandemic. And um, I had good friends and family to help me through it. Mental health issues, massively depressed. I was depressed for two and a half years during the pandemic. I was depressed for two and a half years. You know what actually helped was at the end of the pandemic, I wrote this book. But what also helped was getting back into shape, my fitness. I gained uh, about 10, 15 pounds during the pandemic. I don't like that. So I started working out. I'm still above the weight that I wanted to be, but now I've turned some of it back into muscle. So again, I still, uh, you guys have seen me in person. You've seen me on stage. I still look good. I just don't like um, the extra little like weight, the little bit of a spare tire that I have, but I'm in, I'm in mostly good shape, very healthy. I've been working out more. I'm converting it into muscle. I just need my washboard abs back. That's what, um, the dojo training will do for me, uh, with the Brazilian jujitsu. But what really got me back on track was doing things. I love like photography. A lot of, you know, that I am a, uh, somewhat of a wildlife photographer. So I do art and I do prints. So doing art, building the art studio in the basement, tinkering with my hands, working with my hands, working out, going outside, doing things and doing other creative work like writing was what really got me through when I was feeling that way. And it was most of the pandemic that I felt that way. So it can be hard to work through the mental health issues, but I, I feel like a lot of it can be achieved. Obviously, you have to do... Um, some things. Sometimes you go to therapy. I went to therapy. Sometimes you seek the health of a professional. Um, I don't do any kinds of medication, but for some people, that's the thing that's best for them. So that's what I would say. Is it too late to grow on TikTok post pandemic? No, people are doing it every day. People are doing it every day. So it's not. Uh, thank you, Zara. Appreciate you. Appreciate you being a channel member. Uh, Jay says, I have a photo channel, but I can't reach monetization. I don't like doing gear reviews. Those are the ones that are gaining most traction. Is there any hope? Try consider doing setup videos and also try doing videos about the photo shoots. Manny Ortiz doesn't just do gear reviews. He shows you how to use the gear. Look at my friend Manny Ortiz. He's crushing it. Maybe that's the right path for you. My wise visions, do you think family vlog and homeschool channels are dying? Homeschool channels are crushing it during the pandemic. I think that you're trying to mix family vlog and homeschool. I would just do a homeschool channel at this point. I think a lot more people will want to see homeschooling content. And I think more people with a lot of things happening will become whole sc homeschool. I would do and I would just cut the vlogging or make a different vlogging channel if you want to vlog. But yeah, but um, we're just getting the last super chats and then I've got to run. Lowering eligibility for fan funding is the best news. I agree. Yeah, switching genres or niches in YouTube, you might as well think of that as switching, um, you might as well think of that as switching your major in college and knowing the credits don't transfer, to be honest. I appreciate your time as well as inspiring stories, tips to help us grow on this YouTube journey. Thank you so much, She Fires, and thank you for also being a channel member. I appreciate you. Um, Melly Cinco is a homeschool mom, so there you go. Is it too late to grow post-pandemic? No, not at all. It's not too late to grow uh, post-pandemic. People are doing it every day. There will be different strategies now that the 80% traffic bump for being at home is over. There will be new strategies to grow post-pandemic. I'll be talking about them in these live streams. I'll be talking about them in the podcast. I actually hint at a lot of it in my book. Make sure you're picking up the book, um, Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from Their Passion in the Creator Economy. Link is in the description. I talk a lot about the future and what is going to happen going forward in the book, but a lot of you are so focused on the future and whether it's too late that you're skipping basic fundamentals and the YouTubers growing right now, they master fundamentals more than anything and that's what's helping them still grow. And I think for a lot of you, it's a imposter syndrome or a fear of failure or a scarcity or a FOMO thing. Mindset is holding small creators back, not the algorithm. The algorithm is just a damn database. It's a database. A database is not holding you back or ruining your life. 
You have to get out of that mentality and stop worrying about, oh, it's too late. You, well, every time one of you asks, it's, is it too late? You're going to see somebody doing the content you wish you were doing. Make it. Every year that happens. That's why I'm going to be doing more of these interviews and creator success stories. Um, Andy, if you want a copy of the book, link is in the description. You can buy it on Amazon. You can request it into your local bookstore. You can even request it into your local library. Those of you who can't afford to buy the book, all you have to do is look up the ISBN number on Amazon or put uh, the title in and request it at your local library or the Libby app and the library will get it to you and then you can read it for free if you are financially strapped and you can't buy a $14 book. You can order it into the library and then you can get it for free and read it. A lot of you are not supporting your local libraries. You are not using that library card. It is a massive resource. So I would definitely uh, suggest more of you uh, do that. Yes, Mitch, I am using the live stream and the active income that are donations, the passive income that are book sales, the passive income that is ad revenue all at once and the affiliate links all at the same time. That is the way to do it. I don't just tell, I show, I actually live it. I walk the walk. So yeah, A plus Russian, you're going to do the library thing. Thanks for the tip. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I do believe you can get it on Kindle Unlimited. I think you can. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember whether it's in Kindle Unlimited or not. I may have not done the exclusivity because I wanted people to be able to get it from the library as well and stuff like that. So I may not have done the exclusivity. But yeah, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate you. Stay awesome. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. And I will catch you next time.